Great. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, October 21st, 2021 Tree Commission meeting. Um, the, uh, oh, I had to, the opening statement in front of me one second ago, or here it is. I'm gonna read the opening statement before we start. Uh, the Tree Commission does not have the authority to recommend the removal of a city tree for its debris, such as leaves, fruits, nuts, pollen, pine cones, needles, etc. Nor does it have the authority to recommend the removal of a tree for its potential as an allergen or for solar, uh, for solar collector installation, permanent municipal code 40.38.00. The Tree Commission does not have the authority to remove a tree if it is healthy. So does that serve as our call to order? Uh, I guess I should have done the roll call first. Um, so David Robinson. Here. John Rudder. Here. Jim Kramer. Here. Larry Gunther. Present. Tracy DeWitt. Here. And Tony Gill, not, not present. And Colin Walsh, present. So that takes us to approval of the agenda. Uh, Larry Gunther would like to move that we approve the agenda. I'll second that. Great. And um, but before we go through with that, do we have a moment for discussion? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to mention that in the minutes, number seven, um, under commission and staff communication, um, it says the development to develop a community outreach for solar recommendations. And I think it should be for solar and tree. Uh, is that a comment on the minutes? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think right now we're approving the agenda. Oh, Holly, I'm so sorry. Nope, no problem. Your comment is uh, well taken though for the minutes. So, um, okay. Um, Regarding the agenda, um, so I noticed that the um, Poudre Creek Preserve is not on this agenda, but I did notice that in the minutes it said that it would be in this agenda. So um, I don't know, maybe uh, since it, it's a, if it's not on this agenda and since we have the disc uh, issue in front of us, if we could just make sure that that is put on the next the November Tree Commission meeting, please. Um, I, okay, so in regards to this agenda, the agenda has already been published, so we can't add an, we, we can only add an emergency item to the agenda and there's a certain standard for urgency to add something. Yeah, I don't uh, need, I don't need that. Okay, so let's address the, what it might say in the minutes shortly. Um, but I would mention, uh, and I know Rob has said this before, that something that we have to all consider as commissioners is if we own, we've all filled in, filled out forms with the city uh, declaring property, uh, such as home ownership, for example, and if uh, areas are within, uh, uh, is it 500 feet of our homes, Rob, is that right? Um, either 500 or a thousand, depending on what the project and, and the particulars of it are. Yes. Right. And so we have to, we can't, we have to recuse ourselves if something is within that area from our homes. Uh, so I, we have, uh, we have a motion, we have a second. I want to just add one comment and then we'll take a vote on the agenda unless there's other comments. Um, the, the cap uh liaison requested uh an agenda item but we can do the cap as a report and we have an opportunity to give feedback at that time as well 
and the two by two uh, parking lot commission uh, subcommittee also asked for an opportunity to talk with the uh, commission. And we can also do that as a, as a report at the end and there's time for feedback. Uh, that's what my understanding based on talking mm -hmm. with Rob uh, between our last meeting and now. So I just wanted to make sure that it was clear to, to everybody that we have a dedicated time for input uh, on subcommittees and subcommittees are free at any time at the end of the meeting to bring forward uh, report backs and can get feedback. The only thing that can't be done at that time is we can't uh, take formal action at that, at that point in the meeting. In order for something to be, um, uh, for us to take formal action, it does have to be an agenda item. Did I get that, all of that right, Rob? Do you wanna clarify anything? Yeah, that's correct. Great. Uh, with that, unless there's, uh, co unless there's other comments on the agenda, I'll uh, call the roll. Jim Kramer. Aye. John Ruder. Aye. David Robinson. Aye. Uh, Larry Gunther. Aye. And Tracy DeWitt. Aye. And Colin Walsh, aye. So that moves the agenda. So now is an opportunity for uh, brief announcements from commissioners, liaison, and staff. Uh, so Rob, is it your preference that we take uh, th those reports at this point in the agenda or at the end of the meeting, at that point in the agenda? On cap and two by two? Yeah. Those are agendas at the brief communications. Right, so it, that's at the, at the latter part of the meeting, right? Correct. So, so if folks have other uh, announcements, uh, liaison staff commissioners, uh, now is the time. Rob, would you like to start? Sure, I just have a couple real quick ones. Um, Tree Davis is continuing to plant um, for the grant, the Prop 68 grant. And uh, since the last meeting, they have planted trees at the Explore it Science Center in the parking lot to replace some of the trees that have died out there as a train the trainer. Um, the next planting will be on October 30th, Saturday in Community Park um, for an Arbor Day kind of belated Arbor Day celebration and um, tree planting. So that'll be in Community Park from nine to 12 if anybody wants to come out and plant. Uh, we got, I think, 20 to 25 trees slated for that day. Um, and we're gonna have um, the proclamation read and uh, no vendors and things just because of this continued current situations, but we can go out and plant some trees and, and celebrate um, getting some trees in the ground. And then just a um, ordinance revision update. The uh, consultant is taking most of the comments and, and incorporated them. They had a couple of questions of me and then um, they're working on getting those incorporated. And then we're gonna run that through our legal before bringing it back to the commission, just to make sure the recommendations can be legally done and then we'll bring it back. So look in December, January, uh, one of those two meetings, hopefully for that to come back before the commission. Great, thank you, Rob. Mm -hmm. uh, do other commissioners or staff have announcements for the commission tonight? I see Larry raising his hand. Um, thanks, Colin. Yes, just a couple of quick things. So uh, Tree Davis has a tribute tree program and the, usually that makes people make a donation and plant a tree in honor of someone. So Tree Davis has just taken it upon itself to plant a tree in honor of Mark Rivera. Um, I don't need to go into Mark's antecedents in this town. Um, and that will be at 10 a.m. Saturday, December 4th, uh, next to the Compassion Bench where the tree will be planted. Um, and thanks to Rob for helping organize and coordinate this whole thing. Um, everybody is welcome. So just that. And then uh, there is also a legacy tree event of Tree Davis this Saturday, October 23rd from three to five. Everybody's welcome. Um, it is at the Memorial Grove off of Shasta Drive. And it is to honor people who have uh, 
supported Tree Davis uh, in the past. Thanks, that's it. Thank you, Larry. I'm really we, glad to hear about the Mark Rivera tree. Um, any other uh, commissioners or staff who would like to uh, make an announcement? I, I, would, I would. Okay, I see, uh, I'm gonna recognize David and then Tracy, I see your hand, you'll be next. If, if I could just add at the, the um, event this weekend at the Memorial Grill, please um, RSVP. There is an online link for that if you wanna go. Thank you, David. Tracy? Hi, thank you so much. I just wanted to point out um, uh, uh, some slides that were um, presented um, by Alan Hirsch um, regarding the beautiful colors of the trees right now. And I just wanted to recognize that if something like this was um, maybe presented to children, it would really raise awareness as to the different, you know, like the, the trees, the colors that trees provide in the different seasons and help um, bring awareness and appreciation to our canopy. Um, anyways, I just wanted to somehow, I just wanted to put that out there in case there was some way somebody had an idea of how we could get that to, um, you know, in the hands of um, children. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Tracy. So last call for announcements. Not seeing any, uh, we can move on to public comment. So, do you want to advance the slide? I apologize. I saw some other staff that I was adding in. Um, Good. We do have some public comment. We'll start with Matt Williams. Sure. Uh, but uh, uh, allow me just one sec before we start. So, uh, so at this time, uh, any member of the public can address the commission on matters uh, which are not listed on the agenda uh, or are listed on the consent calendar, or if you're not able to attend uh, the latter part of the meeting. Uh, if you'd like to make a public comment, if you're on a phone, please press nine or you can raise your hand in Zoom. I'll turn it over to you, Steph. I am experiencing just a little bit of delay, so I'm moving these folks over. Okay, M Matt Williams, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and share your public comment. Here we go, unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, two, two public comments of things not on the agenda. First is that the, um, the agenda document has a link in it. The PDF uh, has a link in it for the Zoom, but you cannot activate the, uh, the link because it is an image PDF rather than a um, individual lines PDF. So there's nothing that you can't activate that. Please in the future, put the agenda out as a non-image PDF. The second thing, uh, and I hadn't planned on this, but Tracy's comment made me think of it. Um, there is an absolutely spectacular website that is californiafallcolor.com. All one word, all lowercase, although the case doesn't matter. Californiafallcolor.com covers the whole state, and it is done by professional photographers who are absolutely on top of California fall color. It provides uh, a map that shows where fall color is in the cycle all through the key hotspots in the map. And it shares spectacular photographs that are absolutely current. So um, Tracy, I'd like you to add uh, in your recommendation to the city that they include californiafallcolor.com as part of that. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Thank you, uh, Matt. Okay, and we will go to the next commenter. Um, that will be Alan Hirsch. Just one moment while I move these. I'm having a little bit of delay today, so I apologize. No problem, thank you. Can I have my slides up? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before I begin, I want to note, before I take you down this, this walk here, this beautiful walk, I want to welcome Alan, Alan Laurie, who has been nominated to the committee on Tuesday, on Tuesday by the City Council. He's a wonderful addition. He has lots of experience. He's an architect. He's done projects. He will, and he has an architectural viewpoint of the world. And I think that'll be a wonderful addition to the committee. So I'm so excited that he's, he's, he, he was, he was, he was, he, he stepped forward and he's been chosen by the city council. The next slide. So this slide is uh, take a walk for urban forestry. I think this is my barbaloo bear on the shop. Look at the beautiful forest he's going through. It's not quite as pretty as California, but it's okay. So this is, this. I'm going to um, you've seen this thing. You can walk this thing. This picture's look for itself. But I'm giving you a backstory here. Look at this picture. Look at the canopy over the street. The reason these colors are so pointy is because you have a wonderful canopy over the entire street. This street is walkable, it's bikeable, it's it's you can walk your dog down even in the heat of the day because it's shaded. This is wonderful. This is El this, this El the streets in western central Davis are wonderful. Next slide. Um, next slide is a pistachio tree. Slide please, please. This is a pistachio. It's a gorgeous. It's my neighbor's tree, or it was. This tree was. This tree is now gone. It took us last year at the peak. This tree was top when it was about two or three years old. And it got included work and it fell apart at its peak. Really sad. Tr pruning is really important, but pistachio trees are gorgeous. We still plant them, but we need to make sure we take care of them well in the first couple of years. Next slide, please. London plains, look up close. They heal, they heal their wounds. They are, they are almost, they're, they're impermeable. You can hardly bad prune them. They're great, but look up close to the leaves. The leaves are wonderful. Next slide. The micro as well is important. Ginkgo trees are wonderful. This, the gold is amazing. Look at this tree on the corner here. If you look really close, you'll notice it was button pruned. The limbs are coming off at four, three and four and five feet up, really too low. This tree was not pruned correctly. It's a gorgeous tree, but we could have been nicer if they would have cared for the tree and pruned it a little bit better. We can do better in the future. This is a 50 year tree. I don't want to take it down. We shouldn't prune it, but we need to be aware of the pruning issues. Next slide, slide six. Again, oaks, this is a wonderful oak. Notice this is really high canopy and the oak has a nice V, high up V thing. You prune the height of the tree based on how it grows. Some trees grow up in a nice V, some trees grow sideways, some trees go up and then come down. You need to prune the height of the tree based on how it, is, how it grows in the future. Next slide. Um, the micro stuff and macro stuff, look down, look at the small stuff. Next slide. The point of this whole presentation was the, the, the hidden, the backstory was, I want to get people involved with urban forestry or the master plan. And the next two slides are about pruning of the tree, heights of the trees. And we need to talk about that. This is us on forestry right in downtown. Nice high tree canopy. Next slide, please. This is downtown, low trees. You can't see the signs. We need to talk about how we prune our trees and how to do it carefully. I know there's some science here, but this is a really important. This is as important as the type of tree we choose, how we prune the trees. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Alan. And I don't have any more public comment at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the public commenters. Um, so, at this point, uh, we're to the um, consent calendar. Uh, the, in our last couple of meetings, we've moved our minutes to the consent calendar. So if someone would like to talk about the minutes, uh, we, the, I guess the process is that um, someone would ask to pull the minutes from the consent calendar for discussion. Uh, Larry? Um, yeah, I guess, uh, given Tracy's comment, I would like to pull the minutes from the consent calendar to discuss them. Thank you. Great. Are there any other comments?
comments. Um, we can also move the rest of the consent calendar. Do we? Um, Larry Gunther would like to move the rest of the, the remainder of the consent calendar. Great. Um, I'm still seeing Alan Hirsch as a uh, panelist, just by the way. Okay, so we have a motion. Uh, is there a, uh, a second? So we would be moving the consent calendar minus the minutes is the motion. I'll second that. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, so I'll, I'm not, raise your hand if there's discussion, otherwise I'll, I'll just go right to calling the roll. I'm sorry, uh, Colin, were you suggesting a discussion for the minutes? I, or, or are you it's, calling the uh, roll to do the consent for all the, everything else? Uh, the consent for everything else, which is just one item. Okay. Uh, point of order, Chair, I think if there's discussion, we shouldn't, it shouldn't be on the consent. So I think we can just- Right, that makes sense. Down. Thank you, uh, thank you, Larry. Okay, uh, so calling the roll, uh, Jim Kramer. <clears throat> Maybe you, uh, perhaps you're on mute. Uh, Sorry, hi. Tracy DeWitt. Aye. Larry Gunther. Aye. Uh, John Ruder. Aye. David Robinson. Aye. And Colin Walsh. Aye. So moving that, we can now discuss the minutes. Um, would it be possible for staff to put the portion of the minutes that Tracy brought up earlier on the screen? Is that? Uh, e, let me let me see what I can do, hold on. I think it's page four of the agenda and I'll probably help clear this up. Or no, it's uh, earlier past I'm, that. I'm looking at actually page eight, it's um, numbered, uh, it's Page eight, it's item number seven under commission and staff communication. One moment. Page eight. Wait. Yes, thank you. And there it is. So um, my concern was here, number seven, under commission and staff communication. Um, as you can read, go down to where, you don't have to scroll down, but just read down, you don't have to scroll down. Just read down to where it says, discussion also include the following. Bullet point number one, developing a community outreach for solar and a tree recommendations in parking lots yeah so not just solar recommendations but i really wanted to reach out to the community regarding both trees and solar considerations and obviously it's related to the two by two because it's under that subcommittee update okay i think that's a Excellent point. Does anyone else have comments on the minutes? Um, would anyone uh, possibly like to make a motion to approve the minutes with the addition that Tracy has pointed out? I'll make that motion. Okay. Uh, do we have a second? Well, I'm happy to second if I'm able. Um, uh, sorry, I dropped from the Zoom call. Can we repeat the motion, please? Uh, uh, David Robinson made the motion to move the minutes with the addition that uh, Tracy has pointed out, uh, the adding to section seven, 
um, discussions also including the following, developing a community outreach for solar recommendations and, uh, and tree recommendations. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. And did we have a second? Do it, seconded. Oh. Yeah, oh. I did second oh, yeah. it. Great, so I'll call the roll. Uh, You'll, you'll note I'm going down this, the same list uh, as I call the roll this evening. That'll help, I think, as we get into later discussions. Uh, and it's exactly the roll as it appears on the city website. And uh, Jim Kramer, you're at the top of the list. Aye. Tracy DeWitt. Aye. Larry Gunther. Aye. John Ruder. Aye. David Robinson. Aye. And Colin Walsh, aye. Thank you for that, you guys. Actually, um, we, I think we had public comment, or we missed, did we miss public comment before voting on that? Sorry. Oh, we, um, do, Rob, do we did we need to take public comment on items removed from the consent calendar? We probably did, huh? You can. You don't have to. I think just with the nature of it, I don't think it's a real controversial that there's no public comment on adding the word tree. Okay. Uh, I. Okay. Um, I'm not. I do see a hand among our attendees. Uh, well, it's a little after the fact, after we voted, but I guess I would rather err on the side of caution uh, with the uh, commissions um, would, would humor that uh, and take the one comment that I'm seeing from hands in the attendees. With that direction, um, I will go ahead and add uh, Alan Hirsch. Uh, one moment. For some reason, the moving is a little delayed. There we go. Okay. Alan, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and share your comment. Thank you very much. Just in future, I think you, the tree commission has a policy that when a public makes a presents documents to your commission, they should be included in the minutes. I'm not sure if this was true at the uh, September meeting, but in future, when a public would, uh, when it, when, as a risk, I know the city is trying to do respect and and respect as well as civility. And if someone spends the time preparing a document, I think it would be respectful to include that in the minutes as I was presented, because documents sent to the, I think that would be a respectful thing. And also I encourage, especially, I know you include the list, the list of people, attendees, but it's very frustrating that I can't see who's attending the meeting. The commission, when I'm on gallery view, I can see who was attending the meeting, but when I'm on, uh, particip I'm on gallery, when I'm participant of the meeting, you made me for the comment. I can see who's attending, but when I'm I just just watching in, I can only see Colin's name. And I think on the Brown Act, I should be able to see the entire attendees of the meeting. Who's watching? I think that's part of the, uh, the Brown Act to see the entire meetings. Because I don't understand. You, there's all sorts of nonverbal expressions that are happening here. I think that should all be public. So uh, I hope those two things are considerations: attached documents and basically gallery view for the for the public, just like members of the commission. Thank you, uh, Alan. Um, I don't think anything that Alan put forward requested a change to what we've done, fortunately, uh, for, for these uh, minutes other than a uh, consideration for a potential procedural change that, that we can talk with staff about uh, for the future. Um, if I might, Chair, I think the gallery view is something that the attendee has control over, that the individuals have control over. Um, thanks, Larry. So I, I think that brings, that brings us to our tree removal requests. Rob, you want to take it away? Okay. Um, we'll just take them in order as we go. So the first tree is at 704 Coolidge Street. It is a hackberry in the front left portion of the parking lot or the um, 
lot. Um, it's in a row of uh, trees, private trees as well. Um, the tree upon inspection is in, in good health and um, otherwise structurally sound. Um, the tree minimally, minimally overhangs a roof. If you go to the first slide, Chelsea. So there's the tree. You can see that it's on the left-hand side of the property and, and the homeowner trees are there on the right. Um, next slide. And the, the branch with the arrow is really the kind of the majority that hangs over the roof. It's cleared by 10 feet at least over the, the portion of the roof that could easily be trimmed back away a little bit from the roof line um, to raise a little more of the building clearance over it. Um, but because of the tree's in good health and has no structural problems, uh, the recommendation would be to um, retain the tree and, and prune it as needed to for roof clearance and, and anything else that needed to be done while the, while the uh, contractor was there. Well, if you go to the next slide, Chelsea, there's a good view of the kind of the row of, whole row of trees that's there along the, the frontage of Coolidge there. Was that everything, Rob? That's that's all. That's all I got. Unless there's questions. Okay. Uh, any clarifying questions? I'm not seeing any clarifying questions. Um, with no clarifying questions, uh, we can take public comment. Hey. I have one clarifying question. I was just wondering: Does it say anywhere how long? Um, this um, individual has been living at this address. I understand that the tree was planted in 81, but I'm just curious how long the individual has been dealing with this bully. I have no idea. It's not something I'm privy to. Okay. Uh, are there any additional clarifying questions? Uh, not seeing any, we can take uh, public comment. Uh, we have I one public commenter. Um, I'm sorry, they keep moving. <laughs> there we go. Great. If um, Mary, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and share your comment. Mary, you can press the um, microphone button at the bottom of your screen to unmute yourself and share your comment. Well, there you go. go ahead. I'm, I'm unmuted now, correct? Yes, you are. We can hear you now. Okay. I am the owner of the property. I have lived there since 2013. And uh, this tree, first of all, it was stated that it's in good health and according to the evaluation comments, it is in fair health, if that makes a difference. Uh, the problem with that tree is, as I indicated, it is the bully of my front yard. It encroaches on the other trees, which are two Zelkovas, and they seem to be in good health. They're going to be pruned in November. Uh, this hackberry, uh, drips from some sort of aphid infection. And uh, if I don't have it deep rooted with whatever solution mitigates this problem, I get this sticky stuff all over the sidewalk. And that, in my opinion, um, presents a health hazard, a safety hazard actually, well health maybe. And uh, so that is the reason that I would like it removed. 
And I also have another question. Uh, it, and you indicated at the beginning of your meeting that uh, the commission has no authority to remove a tree if it is healthy. Well, like I said, this is in fair health, but who then has the authority? Does anyone have the authority to remove it? What, what sort of recourse do I have now that I have been issued the edict that the tree stays? Anybody? So we don't generally respond during the comment. You have oh. another minute to, to comment. But oh, I'm you sure don't respond? Oh, okay. Okay, you, I didn't you, know. This is my maiden voyage. Uh, yeah, but we'll, we'll help clear that up for you too. Commission. Okay. So those are my concerns that it goes beyond just the fact that it's in fair health and, you know, it's not um, encroaching on the foundation and lifting my house and all that business, but it is very messy. It also becomes expensive for me to get a pest control cup out here once a year. And even then, sometimes it doesn't always work and it still continues to spew whatever it spews as a result of these insects. So that's it. Thank right. you. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Are there any other public commenters? There is one more public comment. I'm just waiting to make sure it gets moved over. Okay, Alan, you can go ahead and unmute yourself Thank and you share your much. Post. Commissions should be commissions should be dialogues between the city and the community. And there's no legal reason why you cannot respond to a question from the public. And I'm actually kind of a little upset, a little, it's a little disturbing that basically Mary has not been briefed by the by the city arborist about the process here for the meeting. And she, has she has he received the staff report? Um, but you can answer questions relative to the topic in a meeting, especially when the top when the questions are relative to the the agenda item. There's nothing wrong with that. I think if we want to be respectful, I think and we want to appreciate the members of the community the, the community that come forward and attend these meetings. Answering questions is a reasonable sort of thing you can do. I think Mary should be answered directly at the time especially because she's, she's new to these processes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. Uh, are there any other public comments? I do not see any other public comments, any other raised hands at this time. Okay. Um, before we go into commission clarifying questions, um, Rob, would you like to, would you be able to clarify uh, some of the process and questions that Mary had? Um, so the tree commission um, decisions are appealable to the city council if um, you would like. So this isn't the end of the, the line that we have some limitations on what we can do. Um, under by order of the council, but that if uh, you're unhappy with the decision here, or if it's something that frankly we say we can't do, uh, it can be appealed uh, to the to the city council um, to talk with them. So, are there clarifying questions from uh, commissioners? John? Yeah, uh, yeah, Rob, if I could uh, just ask, ask you to clarify. Uh, I know there are a lot of hackberries downtown and this problem uh, exists downtown. Could you just, uh, could you just maybe explain what, uh, you know, what the, uh, what, what, what your division uh, p -p policy is on that and, and, and what you, uh, you, you guys do if you get complaints about that specific uh, uh, aphid problem with the um, we basically don't do anything. We have pressure washed trees downtown um, to clean the sidewalks because the the 
you know, the honeydew is water soluble. Um, uh, we cannot use the treatment chemical per city standards. So we're, we're not able to treat the trees on the city's side. So we have to let them drip or, or pressure wash them. Thanks. Hmm? Great. Uh, Tracy? Thank you, Colin. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to Mary for, you know, just doing something different and new and that we appreciate her taking the time to call in and share her comments. I did want to ask her specifically if she's still available and willing to, to call back in. I'm curious to know why she was considering this tree to be a safety hazard. She did mention, um, you know, that the roots aren't uplifting any parts of the driveway or anything like that. She did just basically talk about, um, I mean, she even said the surrounding trees that, um, that this tree tends to bully um, are in good health. So I'm just curious to know, is her main concern about the um, drippy stickiness from those woolly aphids? Um, because I just wanted to let her know that I completely can identify with that, where I've had, you know, these leaves stuck to my feet, they're, they have decorated my dog, you know, because they're just so sticky and everywhere. Um, and I, I just wanted to recommend to her, and I don't know if this is a, a fair or good recommendation, it's just something that I do because I have the same problem, but um, it's about $25 or $30 at Ace Hardware, and it is a 12-month tree and shrub to protect and feed, and it tends to really take care of that problem. It's just a one-time um, application and it lasts for the whole year. And again, it's about $30. So I just wanted to mention that to her. And um, if she could just answer that question about why she considers it a safety hazard. Thank you. Okay, I see that uh, it looks like Mary's still in the, uh, among the attendees. Um, if we can bring her back to uh, answer uh, Tracy's question. Thank you so much. Mary, if you're able to unmute yourself again, um, sure. just, there you go. Uh, well, it's a safety issue because it's so slippery and a lot of people walk by. Um, I live in a neighborhood where people have little kids and dogs and that sort of, and there's a lot of traffic in that respect. Aside from that fact that it's aesthetically ugly to have all this drippage. And um, I also feel that, uh, you know, my Zelkovas are huge. And that ought to be enough in, in the front yard. And, um, you know, just aesthetically, but of course, that probably isn't the main issue, although to me, it's an issue. But I guess the drippage and the stickiness is not pleasant at all. And um, I have had a um, pest control company from Sacramento come and treat it, which I prefer to do rather than going out there myself. And so um, that's the issue with the dripping. It makes it a safety issue if it's slippery. That's it. Thank you, Mary. I appreciate you uh, coming back and helping uh, clear, uh, answer Tracy's questions. Uh, and let me say too, I, I used to live on Buchanan uh, just around the corner from you and walk my dog past your house all the time. It's a beautiful neighborhood, uh, one of my favorite neighborhoods in Davis. Uh, really uh, a, a gem. Uh, with, with that, uh, we can move if there's other questions or there's uh, points of discussion among the commissioners. I'm looking for hands, if anyone does. Larry? I think you're on mute, Larry. Yeah, my space bar didn't work. Okay, um, just some points, uh, as, as Mary stated, I think she saw it, but just to reiterate, our charter specifically uh, prohibits us from taking out healthy trees just for nuisance issues. Um, and we have a huge hackberry at my house and it does produce 
the sticky emission from the woolly aphids sometimes. And it's not, I notice other trees do it in years where ours doesn't, uh, we don't treat it at all. Um, but the treatment often used uh, is a neonicotinoid, which I think is why the city is uh, not, is barred from treating uh, the city trees with it. Um, and also as Rob stated that if, uh, that this, the decision we make tonight is, uh, can be appealed by city council. And I also wanted to state that I might, I think Colin's intention in not answering during the public comment was to not detract from the time of the public comment, not to not answer the question. That's it. Thank you, Larry, and, and you're absolutely right. Uh, is there any other discussion or does someone want to put forward a motion? Um, I would move that we follow staff recommendations. We have a motion. I'll second that. Okay, uh, we have a motion and a second. Um, And uh, oh, where did my list go? <laughs> All right. Uh, well, this won't be in quite the same order. Uh, so I'm going to go down the roll. Uh, John Ruder. Yes. Jim Kramer. Yes. <clears throat> uh, Larry Gunther. Aye. Tracy Dewitt. Aye. And Colin Walsh. Aye. Rob? Okay, the next address has two trees that were put in for removal um, at 1015 Acacia Lane. Um, both of the trees are silk trees um, and both of them kind of have the same problems and uh, recommendations. Um, so Chelsea, if you go to the first slide. Um, so we'll take the front left tree first. Um, it's uh, again, like I said, it's a floss soap or a silk tree. Uh, if you go to the next one and the tree has uh, multiple limbs with decay in them. Um, so you can see it's not as, as big, um, but you can see a pretty good size limb wound on the top of the wound where the arrow is um, that's decaying um, up on top and down into the tree. Um, that's one of the main scaffold branches, and it goes over to the neighbor's uh, driveway. If you could go to the next slide, Chelsea. And on the other part uh, of the tree, all of the arrows are showing um, old pruning wounds that have not completely sealed over. And with the silk trees, they create cavities. So there's cavities in all of those um, old pruning wounds, which means that the stem there is more than likely hollow from the bottom arrow up to the top arrow. Uh, if you go to the next slide, I think there's one more on this tree. And then um, on where the main branch attachment is that goes to the house, um, there's another uh, limb that's decaying there. Um, so due to the, the you know, poor um, compartmentalization and the decay in this tree, we're staff, I'm recommending that it be removed and replaced. Um, so we don't have that uh, limb, those limb failure or the whole tree failure. <clears throat> uh, if you go to the next slide, and then the front right tree is a, a little smaller tree, um, but with the same uh, kind of problems. Again, it's a silk tree. If you go to the next slide, Chelsea. And again, both arrows are showing um, either one large pruning wound on the left and it looks like a limb that a previous limb failure on the right that had ripped down. Um, the one on the right um, has decayed down into where all of three main scaffold branches are attaching. So that's a, a big failure point um, there on that one. So again, just recommending removal and replacement um, of the of this tree as well. And that's what I have for those two.
Thank you, Rob. Uh, do we have any clarifying questions from commissioners? John? Yeah, uh, Robbie, if I could just ask uh, from my own knowledge, um, is, 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 is what we're see seeing on this tree, is it primarily, <coughs> excuse me, a, a function of the, uh, the tree trimming technique? And number two is, or part of the same thing really, is, um, is this particular species uh, more, more subject to this type of damage? So therefore we probably wouldn't, wouldn't replant the same type of tree. You're on mute, Rob. It's a function of the species, John. Um, the one limb there, it looks like it had a failure um, and it ripped down. But uh, Chelsea, if you could go back to where those cavities are shown, um, I think it's on the front left tree, one more. So those, those pruning wounds were done correctly. The tree just takes a really long time to seal those wounds over. And in that time frame, this species does not, it has real wood that decays really fast. So um, it's just a function of the species of tree. And we, we no longer plant um, silk trees just for that reason. Okay. Um, and they're, they're a fairly short-lived tree. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rob. Yep. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other, uh, Tracy? Uh, sorry, thanks, uh, Colin. I just want to say thanks, John, because I had the exact same question about this type of tree. So um, if there's no other discussion items, I'd like to make a motion to go ahead and follow staff recommendation to remove this tree and replace it based on its um, uh, just uh, what was the word that you used? Decay. Point order. We might want to wait till public comment until we make a motion. Yep, I was going to follow with the same that uh, we should take public comment first. Uh, but I yes, appreciate. Of course, sorry. Um, unless there are any other uh, clarifying questions, um, I'd like to take public comment. You can press nine or uh, press raise your hand in Zoom to uh, ask to make a public comment. At this time, I'm, no, I'm not seeing any public comment. Thank you so much. Uh, so with that, uh, is there any discussion or would someone like to make a motion? I'm looking for a hand. Larry, uh, I would like to move that we make us that we follow staff recommendations. Do we have a second? Yeah, I'll, I'll second that. Thank you. And always feel free to blurt out the seconds. Uh, so we keep keep rolling. Thank you, John. Uh, so with that, I will uh, take the roll. Uh, Jim Kramer. I am. Tracy DeWitt. Aye. Larry Gunther. Aye. John Ruder. Aye. David Robinson. Aye. And Colin Walsh. Aye. Great. And that's you again, Rob. Okay. And the next tree, um, Kevin Fong's here to present that. Um, this item, it's a public works uh, submission. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin at this point and then um, answer any follow-up questions if there is any. Yes, so this, um, tree, this holly oak tree at 440 A Street is currently in the way of um, the sidewalk. It's uplifting the sidewalk panel, which is only about three feet wide right now. And as part of our ADA um, improvements project that we have annually, which repairs curb ramps and sidewalks, which have trip hazards, this was one of the locations that was requested to be fixed because right now the ADA path to travel, it the trees uplifting the sidewalk panel and forcing 
people to be sloped towards the roadway. So in order to make this location ADA compliant, the tree would have to be removed. And we've talked with the sorority at 440A Street and requested or asked them to see if they would be open to providing us with an easement to put the sidewalk on their property. And they had preferred that we would remove the tree instead, but they were open to us planting a replacement tree on their property. So that's why, that's why this tree is requested for removal. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, do we have any uh, clarifying questions? Tracy? Thanks, Colin. I was just reading and it says that um, in the staff report that in order to repair the sidewalk and, and prevent the issue from worsening, staff recommends the trees be removed. So, and, it, and then it says an appropriate number of trees will be planted to replace the two trees removed. So is it referring to both of these trees? I was, I didn't catch that because I thought it was just the one. Yes, it's referring to both of those trees. There's two trees there in um, each location. The sidewalk next to it is only about three feet wide, three feet to three and a half feet wide. So it's not wide enough for ADA compliance as is. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Larry, I see you have your hand up. Um, Tracy asked my question, so I got the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Um, the picture, so one of the trees is uh, away from the sidewalk, or is away from the road, and one of the trees is closer to the road. And uh, my understanding is that the the you said the uh, the trees are causing the pavement to slope towards the road, um, which um, doesn't really make sense to me for the one that's actually on the screen right now, um, the one I think that's to the east. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you clarify, is the, is the pavement sloping towards the road in this picture? So in this picture, the tree that's um, the first one that you see, it's not sloping it towards the roadway, it's the tree behind it that's sloping the pavement, the sidewalk towards the roadway. The tree in front of us right now, the sidewalk right next to it is only about three to three and a half feet wide. So if we were to try to provide a larger tree well, we wouldn't have any sidewalk for pedestrians to cross. Is what's in the picture currently ADA compliant? No, it's not. And then can I ask just one more question? Thank you so much, Kevin. Is uh, how is this, what, in what way is this first tree, the one in the picture closest to us, uh, not ADA compliant? So for an ADA path of travel, it requires a sidewalk width of at least four feet or 48 inches. And the panel of sidewalk right next to that tree is only about three to three and a half feet wide. Okay. And does the, I guess I do have one more question and that's, does the ADA laws require retrofitting in this circumstance to bring it up to ADA compliance? Because this sidewalk obviously was put in quite some time ago in this way. Is it required by ADA to remove the tree to be compliant? Um, ADA doesn't go into specifics about if you have to remove a tree. It's just in order to make this sidewalk ADA compliant, we would need it to be 48 inches wide. And if the property adjacent to the sidewalk doesn't want to grant us an easement, it's not in the city's best interest to go through eminent domain to try to obtain additional right-of-way just to construct some sidewalk. Right. 
So in this case, it's easier to remove the tree and construct our minimum right. four foot wide sidewalk. And I guess let me be uh, let me clarify. Uh, so the the city is at risk of an ADA lawsuit if we do not act to to fix the situation. Is that what that's that's my understanding of what you're saying? Is that right? Okay, cool. And uh, about, so I, yeah, that clear ADA path of travel. Right. Cool. Thank you. So, thank you, uh, John. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so I'm getting the impression that uh, if this tree is taken out, uh, a species that's going to get this large again can't be be be, be put be put back. We need to get some other some other tree growth form uh, uh, to, to to go in here. Is that correct? Correct. Um, we wouldn't be planting the tree in the sidewalk to prevent this issue again. It would be planted elsewhere. Okay, so that area that area would lose any type of benefit from the from a trees those two trees. The sorority next door was willing to take on a tree or two on their property, one that's oh. appropriate. Okay, okay. Um, is there any um, is there any way that we could be more assured of their will willingness to, to do that? Um, um, you know, before we, we sorry, go, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, I emailed um, with the leader of the sorority and they said that they would be open to having some trees on their, or at least one tree planted on their property. Okay. So from your experience, you're, uh, you're, um, you're, 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 you're satisfied that, 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 that they probably will follow through or that they are likely to follow through on that com commitment? Yes, because they do like the trees. They're providing shade for their sorority as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good, thanks. Thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, Tracy, I see you have your hand up. Hi, thank you. I have four questions. So the first question is, is there any other ADA accessible route of travel? Along the sidewalk? Um, no, if we close this off, then the ADA path of travel would be on the north side of Russell Boulevard. And so an individual who's maybe trying to get to the sorority would have to circle around uh, the three corners to get to this corner. Correct. Okay, and how old are these trees? I'm not sure how old they are. Are they in relative good health? Kevin, I can answer that. The, the oak tree is in relatively good health. The, the ash tree, if you could go one back, Chelsea, is showing signs of decline. It's got a thin canopy on the upper canopy and some dieback kind of throughout the upper canopy. So that one is not in real great health. Thank you. Um, and in regards to the sorority and the efforts to discuss with them their options and what they are willing or open to do, I was curious, you said you spoke with the lead of the sorority. Are they the owners of the house? Yes, they're the owners of the house. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands for clarifying questions. So let's take uh, public comments on this. So if you have a public comment, please press star nine uh, on your phone or raise hand in Zoom. And we have Alan Hirsch with public comment. Alan, you can unmute yourself and share your comment. I'm kind of heartbroken to see healthy trees removed because of bad planning because someone moved the street and didn't accommodate trees or planted the trees in the wrong place. Young people are very environmentally oriented. 
And I, you say they like the trees, but they're willing to remove them. And the plant stump trees will take decades to get there because they won't allow a temporary easement because it's only temporary because those trees are going to die and the people will have to reroute it. And they certainly they can't build any closer to the street. It could be a temporary easement. I'm really surprised that that you can't. That we couldn't have some accommodation. Was was it, was it, whether was these contacts only by email or were they personal contacts? Were these framed framed as temporary as temporary easement? I'm really I really wonder whether these trees could an easement couldn't be put in temporarily to save these trees at least for the life of the trees. I would urge the commission to basically put this back a month and we should have further investigation and maybe the commissioners could make contacts with the, the sorority. I can't believe that they would not find some accommodation for a temporary easement to save these trees. These are, this is in downtown, this is A Street. This is a major corridor to and fro. We need to save those trees. It'll take decades to recover this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. We have one more public commenter, Matt Williams. You can go ahead and unmute yourself and share your comment. Um, this comment applies to this one if you actually approve the taking out of the tree, but it really applies to all the other ones like the last one where you did actually approve the removal of the tree. Uh, I think it would be very much more value to the citizens, especially the individual citizen associated with the tree, if there was a recommendation of what kind of trees would be good to put in there. That really applies to this situation. I, have, I concur strongly with Rob Kane's assessment of the ash tree. I think that, that removing that tree and putting a tree in the front yard of the sorority is proactively dealing with something that we're gonna to have to inevitably deal with in the next less than five years. So why not act proactively now and having a recommendation as to what would be trees that would be long lived, meet the situation is something that I think the tree commission ought to be giving to anyone that they're making a decision. It isn't going to be one species, it's going to be a, a group of, of them, but that would be useful. It also is going to be helpful to you as you look at an individual species of tree. Uh, I don't particularly know how well the ash is, is matched to the, uh, the Davis climate, but Rob can give some indication of that. Often our problems are that the wrong trees have been planted in the right places. And uh, let's make sure that when we remove and replace a tree that we're replacing it with something that isn't gonna create the same problem down the road. Thank you very much. I appreciate your listening. Great. Thank you to the public commenter. Um, staff, Colin Walsh has been moved into the attendees side. So I'm taking over momentarily as vice chair. Can he be put back into the panelists? <clears throat> and if we could ask Mr. Williams to mute himself so we don't hear the television in the background. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, thank you very much. I apologize. There's a little bit of bouncing around as things are changing. Um, Colin, I am very sorry. Yeah. No problem. I totally understand and sympathize. I, and I very much appreciate what you're doing and I appreciate it as someone who uh, hosts uh, Zoom meetings uh, and trials done over Zoom. So I've been in your seat exactly and I totally get, get it, so. Uh, no, no ill feeling here at all. All appreciation. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, do we have any other public comments? I am not seeing any other raised hands at this time. Okay. Uh, so coming back to the commission, um, if folks have a discussion, Larry? 
Sure. So um, I think Matt was kind of implying a two by two matrix with uh, right species, wrong species, and right place, wrong place. And I think this these trees cover three of the four potential outcomes. Um, perhaps. Anyway, I think you know trees in the middle of the sidewalk. It could be a good idea, but I think it's not a good idea. And you know, having lived here for 26 or seven years, I don't know what the count is anymore. Um, and those trees, while they're fun to go around, um, if you're on a bike going the wrong way, which you, you shouldn't be, and I'm saying this in case anybody's ever done this, um, they're, they're difficult, they are difficult to get around. And I am, a, I am a, I try and be very aware of uh, ADA accessibility issues and so these, I think they're just planted in the wrong place. And while a temporary easement for the life of the tree is possible, I think I'm a, I'm a fan of doing it right. And um, so I think working with the sorority um, and in, in response to, uh, I think something Matt said, um, Rob Kane does work with the people who are going to get a new tree on the species, and there is a species list. Uh, the species list is being updated by the city and with the help of Tree Davis to be um, kind of up to date with regard to our potential climate. Um, so I would also like, uh, and I'm sure Rob will mention this to the people um, if we approve the removal of this tree, but there is the community canopy program, which we could get a tree, um, which they can get a tree from. And um, I'm prepared to make a motion to follow staff recommendations. Okay, I see that we have a couple more, a couple more hands for discussion. Um, so in the, uh, was was that a motion or is it just that we're you're ready for a motion, Larry? Let's hear the uh, rest of the discussion by the commission and then. Okay, so I see Jim, John, and uh, Tracy. Uh, so let's uh, take Jim and then John and then Tracy. So I'm more or less just uh, endorsing what what Larry said. I have a very dear friend who is blind. And yet she uh, walks extensively around town. She lives near Village Homes and yet managed to walk downtown. And she has complained to me many times about trees in the middle of the sidewalk that it's just very, very difficult for her. Uh, so I, I grieve about these trees, but I'm more concerned about ADA compliance. Thank you, Jim. John? Yeah, um, if I can ask Kevin a question. Uh, Kevin, the, uh, the easement uh, option that's being uh, discussed here, um, from a, a public works perspective, um, engineering perspective and a transportation point of view, uh, you, uh, could you just give some, uh, some, some pros and cons of, uh, of that type of easement uh, and that type of new path for, as Jim was saying, for for vision impaired people and people in, in, in chairs and stuff. Is, is that gonna be harder for them to, to navigate an easement approach? Um, I think if we want the easement approach, it would be harder to navigate. If we had a wide enough easement, probably not. But then just having an easement for the life of the trees is, hard as well because then someone would have to recall that this easement has been recorded on this property and is set to expire once a tree dies and then the city would then have to go in tear out the existing sidewalk again and re-pour it right yeah it sounds it sounds like um um well, what i'm hearing you saying is is that even if an easement were placed in there it wouldn't it wouldn't necessarily solve all the problems of the uh, the, the, the handicapped a, a, a accessibility. Is that, is that right. fair to say? It would just be somewhat delaying the inevitable because as the tree grows, 
eventually if it grows too large, um, unless you're putting the sidewalk out in the street, you're going to run out of space going towards the house. Right. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tracy? Thank you. Thanks to all the commissioners for their comments. Um, I um, would like to, I mean, I, I understand, um, Mr. Fong, the issues that were that are presented here. And overall, I'm definitely in favor of what's going to be best for the people. Um, but it's, I just question, I'm wondering if there was enough communication and understanding with the owners um, regarding um, their property and the easement. Um, I'm, I'm kind of leaning to, you know, try to keep the oak tree if that's at all possible. And, um, you know, to allow for appropriate ADA um, accessibility and travel. Um, but, you know, to remove the ash to allow for that since the ash is, is um, not doing so well um, anyways. Um, and since we don't really know how old that oak tree is, it could be a significant amount of time um, that it could be providing, um, you know, all that trees provide. Um, so then I was curious to know about, um, yeah, removing and replacing that ash tree to allow for better ADA accommodations and then better communication or more clear or, I don't know, more effort put into the communication with the, with the owners, and, and especially to replant the tree. Um, on their property and of course so that you know with an appropriate tree to the location so i guess what i'm saying is is it worth it to communicate with the owners of the sorority to hold on to the ash or not the ash the oak um, and to um, see if we, they'll be willing to plant maybe two trees on their property since eventually this oak is gonna to have to go down. I don't know. Thank you, Tracy. Um, I see a couple uh, hands from John and Larry. I'm gonna offer a, a, a comment before I uh, move on to you guys. Um, a couple things. Uh, so I was asking in the clarifying questions about ADA regulations, and there's a couple things with ADA, right? One is, you know, is the city, you know, one, some people comply because it's what the law is and it's, you're at risk of lawsuits if you don't do it. But I, from my perspective, the higher reason to, to do it is because uh, you want people to be able to have uh, mobility. Uh, and so I just wanted to clarify that, that, that this actually meets both standards that to, that we need to do, make a change here, both for mobility and for liability reasons. Uh, the one other thing I wanna point out is that I, I kind of get, I get the impression that as we look at this, we see this road as immutable and there's no, we're asking to move onto the property rather than into the road. Um, yet we narrowed the road uh, just a, a, a little bit in a, what a block in the other direction just a few years ago. So uh, it's interesting how we think about roads and cars to me that, uh, you know, wouldn't, uh, you know, wouldn't it be nice if uh, we thought about this as, you know, another way to think about this, I guess, is we could, you know, we could suggest that the road be narrowed and the sidewalk be put to the side of the, the to the side. So rather than widening the egress with an easement onto the property, we narrow the, 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 the room for traffic. Um, I know that, that that would be unpopular with many in the city, but I think that it's important that we not take cars and roads as a given. So uh, with that, I want to uh, call on Larry and then John. Thanks, Colin, it's a good point. Um, it, it is the kind of the go-to thing. Um, so it, it's not just width and wheelchairs. So this is actually a great picture. Um, and it's difficult to do, but imagine if you're blind walking down this sidewalk. Right, so if you have a dog, maybe the dog is gonna guide you to the left as we're looking at this away from the street. But if you come up upon this with a cane or some other or, or poor vision, it's not 
I don't know, I, you would probably know from the sound and everything else that the road is on your right so that you need to move to the left, but it's, yeah, trying to, to, <laughs> to look at this from other viewpoints, including those people who don't have sight. I, I just, I mean, this was a bad choice. Planting a tree in the middle of the sidewalk, there's probably an opportunity where that's a really good idea. I don't see it in this instance as a good idea. It was a poor choice at the beginning. And so now actually Colin, I will make my motion uh, to follow staff recommendations. Okay, we have is a I just, if, Is it okay if I just make my- John? Discussion point, yeah. So number one, I, I, I agree with Larry in a wrong, wrong, wrong place. If I could just ask Kevin a, re a really simple, a question was this was this issue um, determined in house or did you guys get complaints or how, how did this come up? Um, it's more in house and looking at how steep it is for the cross slope. ADA compliance is a two percent cross slope, and if you're in a wheelchair going around um, the tree right there, it's more of an eight to twelve percent cross slope. Okay, great. Okay, Kevin, th thank you very much. Kevin, did someone literally look out the window of City Hall and notice that? <laughs> uh, it's a rhetorical no, question. Things have been definitely noticed before. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we have a motion. I'll, I'll second it. Okay, and Rob, uh, just to make sure, Rob, uh, this is something that's within the authority of the commission to do in this instance because they are city trees uh, or I'm just worried about the healthy tree clause. Well, I mean, there's no mitigation to work around these trees, so you're you're well within the parameters of what you guys can do. Great, thank you. Okay, so we have a proper motion with a second, and I will uh, call the roll. Jim Kramer, aye. Tracy Dewitt, I would like to abstain. Larry Gunther? Aye. John Ruder? Aye. David Robinson? Aye. And Colin Walsh? Aye. Rob? Okay, hey, so uh, 721 K Street um, is another uh, two tree uh, submittal. <clears throat> the first tree is the large American elm that's planted to the west or the north or right of the property. Um, it's uh, a large elm tree. If you go to the first slide, please. Um, and you can see that it's been side trimmed for many, many years due to the power lines that run just direct adjacent to the tree on the north. Um, and it's been uh, skinned up and uh, we've, we've pruned it a little bit on the, on the other sides. Um, but if you go to the next slide, uh, the tree has um, continued to have multiple limb failures. I know the um, applicant um, submitted a lengthy uh, well-detailed um, account of all of those. Uh, I'm not going to go through that um, just for uh, time's sake, but uh, just to say that where the arrows are, these trees are, are those wounds are, are beginning to weep. So they're actively decaying, um, continue to decay. Um, they're on large, very large limbs. Um, if you go to the next slide, you can, we can kind of see what it looks like on the, the north side of the tree. Um, is just one wall of, of apocarmic shoots from the pruning that has been done. <laughs> Excuse me. So due to the you know, continued limb failures after trimming um, and some of them um, large ones just due to the um, trimming that's been done, uh, I'm recommending removal and, uh, of this tree. And this kind of ties into the, the tree, that, the second tree. We go to the next slide. Chelsea is the Chinese hackberry in the center. I'm not sure <clears throat> why or how the two trees were planted. Um, I don't know if it was the hackberry was a possible replacement tree for the elm because um, it's so close to the lines. But this tree's in, in good to fair health. Um, 
it's been minimally overshadowed by the elm tree, uh, but I think it could, uh, once the elm, if approved for removal is removed, could uh, recover from um, that and grow into a, a good replacement tree for the property. And uh, just recommending that this tree be retained. It hasn't had uh, any limb failure problems. Um, so not the same situation and the, the tree could be um, monitored and pruned to um, correct any limbs that are um, growing out over to the north or to the right of that picture um, over time. So it could um, have a, a good full canopy. So um, those are the staff recommendations for the two trees to remove the elm tree because it's got actively decaying and weeping wounds um, and then retain the hackberry tree. And uh, I wouldn't recommend replacing um, the elm tree just because the hackberry will fill in the space and there's just not enough room for another tree there, especially with the um, power lines right to the north. Thank you, Rob. Do we have any clarifying questions from the commissioners? Um, uh, Jim? I certainly agree that it, it doesn't appear that we can have a replacement tree there. Can we sort of talk about a replacement tree put somewhere else? Um, if if that's the motion, we can certainly look at a place to put it someplace else. Thank you. Uh, are there any other clarifying questions? Not seeing any, we can take uh, public comment. We have one public commenter. Um, Parker, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and share your comment. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, thank you. All right, thank you for having me this evening. Um, <clears throat> my name is Gene Parker. I'm at 721 K Street, and the, the two trees are why I'm here to discuss with you this evening. Um, I would hope that uh, all of the Tree Commission got a copy of my um, detailed documentation and photo evidence of the problems with the trees. And um, so back in 2016, I decided, uh, hey, I better start documenting these. <laughs> So since then, there's been made this 11 major uh, limb failures on the elm. And, you know, that average that averages out to almost two per year, frankly. So um, to, to save time, I'm just going to summarize, you know, I appreciate the, the commission's uh, recommendation on the elm. Um, you know, that stunted growth due to the trimming has really caused many problems through the years. Um, the, the, the dropping of those huge limbs is really a danger to my family. Um, and my daughter, um, they often land right where she's out playing. Um, it's recently uh, damaged a neighbor's vehicle. It's crushed my daughter's trampoline. I'm so glad she wasn't on it at the time. Um, you know, this tree is going to continue to drop those limbs. It has limbs that are over the physical structure of my house. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, it looks like a ticking time bomb to me. It's just when's the next one going to fall? And at this point, when the wind gets over about 15 miles per hour, my immediate neighbors and I all go move our cars because we're afraid of limbs falling on it. So, um, you know, we're just, we're afraid of this tree. It's a danger to my family and I'd like it removed. Um, regarding the hackberry, um, it, is, it is also dropping limbs. Some have narrowly missed my vehicle, as you could see in some of the photo evidence that I had there. Um, and there's now multiple large cracks or fissures in the lower part of the uh, trunk of the tree, um, some kind of stress and it's opening up there. So I'm not sure what that means for the livelihood of the tree. And then because of the dominance of that large elm, uh, as you were describing, yeah, it, it grows straight up and to the south. It looks so goofy. <laughs> if the elm is to go, it's gonna look really goofy. Maybe in time it could regrow things out on the north side um, but my request and recommendation is that we remove both of them and plant a nice new tree in the middle um, that can have a long life and uh, be beautiful in the neighborhood. 
So um, with uh, 25 seconds left, uh, thank you for hearing me today and uh, appreciate your uh, uh, working with me on these. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. And at this time we have no other additional um, comments. Thank you. Uh, I just want to note that the uh, documentation provided uh, is definitely the best documentation uh, from the public I've seen on uh, limb failure and the light and the health of a tree uh, so far. So thank you for providing that. Uh, are there is there uh, discussion among the commissioners? I see Jim and then John. Yeah, question, question for Rob. I mean, Mr. Parker uh, claimed that there were limb failures and, and poor health and so on <clears throat> on the hackberry. I wonder what your, if you looked at that and what your assessment is of the, the health of the hackberry. Yeah, the hackberry is in good health. Um, the fissures are just are called growth cracks. They're not actual cracks in the trees as the tree gets bigger. Um, it will it will open up because the hackberries are thinner skinned trees. Um, I didn't see any physical cracks in that tree, so um, that one is in in like I said, good to fair health, um, better than most of the hackberries on the street. Um, he's taken you know taken care of it and and done what's needed to um, keep it healthy. So that's that that's what my assessment is. Thank you. John, you had had your hand, but I see it went down. Yeah, I had. I just had the same question as Jim. Thanks. Uh, is there any other discussion, questions, or motions? I'd like to make, make a motion to follow the staff recommendation. Yeah, I'd like to second it. Okay. Uh, Larry, I see your hand. Oh, uh, well, I was going to make a friendly amendment that we follow the staff recommendations, but uh, find a place either on this property or elsewhere nearby, uh, perhaps the park that's just a little bit to the what to the south. Um, but but replace the tree um, either on the property or somewhere else. I don't okay. know if that amendment is amenable to the uh, mover and seconder. Uh, mover and seconder, is that amenable to you? It is to me. Thank you, Larry. The park down the street has probably no room for trees because there are new trees in there, um, but uh, someplace else. Yeah, my amendment was not meant to limit a new location yeah. only to the park or the property, but to find a place to... With that clarification, is that acceptable to you, uh, David? Oh yeah. Yep. Okay. So we have a motion and a second with a friendly amendment to it. Um, with that, uh, I will uh, call the roll. <clears throat> Jim Kramer. Aye. Tracy DeWitt. Aye. Larry Gunther. Aye. John Ruder? Aye. David Robinson? Aye. And Colin Walsh? Aye. Back to you, Rob. Okay, this, this next tree is a, a eucalyptus, a yellow box eucalyptus in the green belt um, next to 5424 Cal Boulevard. It's in the um, kind of green belt bike path area to the east of the property. Um, it is, uh, if you go to the next slide, it's closer to the back of their lot and property. Um, so you can see the tree there, the property is in the background and their fence is um, right. You can see where that is. It's away from the bike path area there. 
Um, if you go to the next slide, and that's the proximity to the, the fence. Um, and in the back there is, is more of a garden kind of garden area um, of the lot. It's a, a pretty good sized property, not over any kind of structures or, or anything like that. Um, the tree did lose a limb. Um, one limb in the, I think a storm two years ago, one of the larger storms. Um, but hasn't lost anything since. Um, if you go to the next slide, there is one limb that you can see that grows over uh, the fence to the west there. Um, and due to the tree health and just the location of the tree is, is fairly low risk to um, property um, is to trim that limb back or completely off and um, retain the tree and do some uh, upper pruning work on the tree to hopefully reduce the likelihood of one of those other limbs um, failing. But um, the area under the trees um, pretty well open and more of a um, kind of unmaintained green belt landscape area. Thank you, Rob. Yep. Uh, do we have any uh, clarifying questions from the commissioners? Larry? Yeah, a, a couple questions for Rob. Uh, so I know that at least some eucalyptus species are, uh, are pretty brittle. Um, I don't know if they're all that. I'll just ask you a couple questions and then I'll let you feel them all at the same time, Rob. Um, also, this seems to have a weird structure where it just kind of breaks up and like a firework. It goes up straight and then there's a bunch of limbs. I don't know if that is a you know result of pruning early on, um, you know, childhood trauma, you might say, or if that's kind of the standard structure of this tree. That's it. Um, yeah, some eukes are more limb failure prone than others. Um, the species does have a, a little higher uh, failure rate for limbs. Um, and then as far as the structure, it looks just like it might just have been a, like you said, not stru totally structurally pruned as it, as it went down the road and grew up. And um, when those, those leaders came out, you know, structural pruning and central leader pruning wasn't a big um, concern or known about how, you know, that, that pruning is important. Um, so it was just a function of how it grew up. Thank you. I would note too, the structure looks very different in the pictures from a different angle. Uh, any other clarifying questions? Not seeing any, uh, we can take public comment. Press uh, star nine or raise your hand in Zoom. We have one public commenter, James. You can go ahead and unmute yourself and share your comment. Hi, Tree Commission. Uh, this is James Liu. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the 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 matter here. Uh, apologies, my video is disappearing. Um, so I'm speaking on behalf of the 5424 Kyle Boulevard Red Gum Eucalyptus Tree Removal Matter. This tree has had uh, actually two large branch falls in history. First, as Mr. Kane reported in 2016, which actually caused over $1,000 of damage to the fences on the 5424 property. The city of Davis refused to cover any of those costs. Second, as I noted, Mr. Kane fails to admit that on September 18th, 2021, another branch fell, missing nearly, nearly missing the repaired fence, but landing on the grass area where many children play, including the homeowner's grandchildren. Um, the homeowner sent an email on that day at 1.22 p.m. to the Davis Parks, so there should be a constructive notice of that. Um, to note the most recent branch fall on September 18, 2021 was on a perfectly sunny day. You can all recall September of 2021 was very hot. There was very few winds. Um, and that branch that fell, I can uh, share my screen. Um, is it okay if I share my screen? The 
so we don't usually share screens from commenters. Uh, okay. We do accept uh, images that are sent to staff in advance of the meeting. Um, All right, that's that's fine. Um, I can just describe the, the branch was over a hundred pounds. It was huge. Um, it was one of the larger branches on that tree. It is in Davis City's, uh, you know, possession because we emailed them the photo. Um, my parents who reside at the 5424 residence and where, where I grew up are not only concerned for their own safety, but the safety of their two young grandchildren who often play in the backyard and surrounding park. Um, the city should know that this tree has dangers uh, based off that um, September 18, 2021 uh, limb fall. Um, the tree is both a danger to the residents and my parents and my nieces. Um, especially considering as we head into fall weather, winds will be picking up and it's likely that more branches will fall. Um, I would like to remind that the Tree Commission just recently in February of 2021, there was a large branch fall that fatally injured a Davis resident at Slide Hill Park. Similarly, we have children, we have young uh, kids that play in this area. I played hide and go seek in that area growing up. Um, and the, the size of that branch as you know, I'm a six foot, 190 pound guy. Even if I held my hands up and braced it, that branch would crush me. Um, should the tree commission choose uh, to follow the evaluator's uh, recommendation and not remove the tree, I just wanna note that um, it would really open the city up to liability. Uh, pursuant to California government code 835B, public entities are liable for injury caused by dangerous conditions of properties, especially if the, uh, if the city had constructive or actual notice, which they do now. Um, the Tree Commission should also be informed that any sort of uh, immunities under 831.2 would not cover the city. Um, the tree is not of natural condition and the park is an improved property pursuant to 831.2. Um, this park is regularly tended by the land. The tree receives water from nearby sprinkler systems. The mulch and uh, wood chips in the area are nat not natural. You should know this property was just uh, created 20, 25 years ago uh, before it was all dirt. So this is an improved property. Um, and pursuant to many uh, California court decisions, such as City, v City of Chico v. Superior Court of Butte County and County of San Mateo v. Superior Thanks. Court, when a tree's locations and roots are, are located within the boundaries of improved property, that tree can be considered improved uh, property. And because the city sits on artificially improved grounds, um, it would put the city liable as such. Uh so we, we ordinarily accept uh, comments of three minutes. Um, so two, two different points here. Uh, one, um, the, you know, I, I'm recognizing that we're in a Zoom meeting and that, uh, Zoom meetings are very different than regular meetings. And that if we'd been at a regular meeting, uh, James would have been able to bring a photo to the meeting and pass it around. Uh, and so I just wanna suggest to James, and draw your attention to the uh, Tree Commission website. There is an email address, uh, treecommission at cityofdavis.org. And this is true for any commenter at any time. Anything that's sent to that goes to all the tree commissioners. If you were to send it right now, we would receive it mid-meeting and commissioners might have the opportunity to see it. Um, uh, I have a sense that James was not, not quite done. James, you're still on the screen for me. Can you nod your head if one more minute would be enough for you to, to wrap up? Is if if it's all right with the other commissioners, I'd like to give uh, Mr. Liu uh, the opportunity to 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 finish. Larry, would, I would make a motion that we uh, allow one more minute to Mr. Liu or uh, any other public comment or get to four minutes. Great. Uh, so there's a motion um, to do so. Uh, second. A second. Okay. So just quickly down. Uh, Jim Kramer. Hi. Tracy DeWitt. Hi. John Ruder. Hi. David Robinson. Hi. And Colin Walsh. Hi. And Larry Gunther is I as well. Sorry, Larry. All right, I, I, I appreciate the tree commission allowing me to speak for one more minute. I probably can finish pretty quickly. That was mostly the end of my um, spiel. Um, and I just wanna emphasize, I grew up in this area, um, born in 1993. I moved back to Davis in April. I understand trees are a really important part of Davis. 
this um but th th there's plenty of trees in that area and that tree has fallen multiple times and there are plenty of kids that play in that area and I'll, I'll send a photo immediately after i'm done speaking uh it, it doesn't seem natural that a, a huge 100 pound branch would just fall in the middle of September on a sunny day. Um, so I think the, the commission should consider removing this tree. I appreciate all your time. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your, your uh, very thorough and detailed uh, approach to the comment. Uh, you, you, you squeezed a lot of information in in a very short period of time. And I could see that you were, you know, you clearly were using your time uh, very judiciously. Uh, is there a discussion within the commission? We have oh, one. I'm sorry, we have one more public commenter. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Alan uh, Hirsch, you may go ahead and share your public comment. Thank you. In terms of sharing documents with the uh, the commission, those documents should also be made concurrently public, and the, that doesn't seem to be any mechanism for doing that. So I think that's both both things, and I think these should I think there should be I think this information should be conveyed to people who apply for removals as part of the process, so that when they attend these meetings, they know how it works. I think the staff staff can do that. There should be an information sheet about how all these rules are. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alan. So sorry for the premature move there, but uh, I think, uh, are there any other public comments? There are no additional public comments at this time. Thank you. Uh, so please, uh, commissioners, please raise your hand if you have questions or uh, items for discussion. John. Yeah, uh, just to, to Two questions uh, for, for Rob. Um, Rob, do you think that um, <laughs> that being the pruning that you're suggesting, uh, do you think that's going to um, uh, um, uh, meet, uh, meet 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 Mr. Liu's uh, re 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 requests and and make that tree um, safer for his parents' property? It would reduce the risk of another limb failure. That that's that's really yeah, all. I, basically. Yeah. Okay. The other um, the other question uh, in terms of uh, the timing, say, of, of removal or fixing, which um, uh, what what would be the expected schedule for completion of a of a, a pruning versus a removal, and and uh, given the schedule and everything else these days. Uh, when when could the city get to the uh, the, the quickest one, quickest uh, solution? Um, seeing there's a 10 day appeal period for removals, the pruning would maybe be able to do that. I, I'd have to look at schedule and with rain coming up, it it may be off quite a bit. I can't really give an exact date or or you know time frame at this point. Yeah. But I mean, are we talking months or six months or two months it, or? Really depends on Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday. I mean, the last yeah, yeah. one in January would have been three months, four months before we got yeah. back to any other work. So okay. it's hard to say. Okay. Okay. So I guess, yeah. Okay. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Tracy? Thanks, Colin. Um, I was just wanting to talk about the extreme contradictions between the uh, customer and the uh, staff comments. So according to the staff comments, it's in good, the tree's in good health and bigger, and um, it is not at high risk to the resident, but the resident feels incredibly unsafe on their property. So I'm concerned about the extreme contradiction here, and it leads me to the question of uh, the soil health, and you know, you know, ultimately the tree health. Um, but the the um, the customer had mentioned uh, that this land, I can't remember the term that that was used, but 
basically the type of land that this tree was planted in holds the city liable. I don't know what that, that was a lot of information and a very quick turnaround. Um, but basically what, what was being said to me is that the customer is not feeling safe at their home. So is, can anybody, uh, Rob, can you help to maybe provide some understanding of these two contradictions or extreme views? Thank you. Um, well, tree health has to be separated out from tree structure and, and risk. So um, there's always risk with living around trees. There's no way around it. The only way to get rid of all the risk with trees is to get rid of all the trees. So um, that is one thing that needs to be understood that because a tree may be healthy or unhealthy does not necessarily mean it may be dangerous or undangerous. Um, and um, going through a risk assessment, um, part of that is where the target is and the, and the frequency of the targets that are there. So um, that tree has minimal targets, which would be a fence or possibly, as the applicant had said, um, somebody playing under the tree. Um, and that's, you know, over a span of uh, 24 hours, seven days, in a month, um, there's probably a pretty low frequency of people playing under there, even though, um, you know, that that would be something is separate, separated out from the um, consequences of a failure hitting the target. So it's a whole, as we went through with the Canary Island Pines a couple months ago, there's a whole risk assessment um, protocol that's done uh, that can be done if the commissions feels that it needs to be done. If they don't approve for removal, we could do that. Um, so that's that's kind of what the, the contradictions are. Um, there's not somebody sitting under that tree 24 seven. So that's a, a low risk for the target frequency. Um, and since there's, uh, you know, there's no permanent or constant target under there that that tree would probably be considered a low risk tree just due to that factor. Thank you, Rob. I see you Can start I your hand, please, Tracy. Yes. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to have a little follow up on that. Um, so from what I understand, Rob, what you're saying is that tree health doesn't guarantee safety, but that because um, this tree is not sitting above a, a sand pit or a play structure, it's basically uh, on the side of a bike path, um, but the, the customer is saying that they go and they play in this area. Um, but knowing that this tree um, has had historical limb failure, it would seem that that would not be the best place to go play. Um, but I'm wondering, are other trees in this area having the same problem with random limb failure? And I also want to know, do eucalyptus generally have this um, problem? Thank you. Um, not aware of other trees having limb failures in that area. There are a group of eucalyptus. Well, there's some that are over off tufts that have lost limbs in the, in the storms. Um, and unfortunately, uh, summer limb drop is a phenomenon that's not understood and, and can't be predicted. So on the calm, hot day in September is a recipe for trees, oak trees in particular, eucalyptus in particular, um, can do have a summer limb drop. Um, so, you know, that's, that's just a phenomenon that's completely not quite understood or, or again, could be predicted. So um, that's, that's what uh, has happened there. Thank you, Rob and Tracy. Jim, I see your hand. Yeah, a quick question for Rob. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned about the, the residents' uh, fear for their, their safety and so on. Is there a uh, mechanism where when there's concern about safety that, that a tree, you know, the, the pruning, the, the, the repair of the tree can be moved up in the schedule and be given priority in terms of 
taking care of the, uh, the, the, the problem as soon as possible. And we could do that um, just depending on what else is, is a higher priority, say dead trees or like I said, there's a storm coming up and that creates could create all kinds of hazards and things that are out there that are immediate. And so, yeah, it would, would really depend on on that. Do you have anything further, Jim? Uh, I have a question, uh, Rob. Would it be appropriate if we, if in a motion, we perhaps included something like uh, to follow your recommendation uh, with uh, and and request or and a uh, follow up uh, inspection of the tree in six months? Is that something we that would be appropriate and work for you? Uh, you could certainly do that. Yeah, that's that's appropriate. Are there any other uh, points of discussion or motions? So I'm sure I would make a motion that we follow staff recommendations. Um, and uh, I note that the staff recommendations specifically call out pruning um, the limbs that overhang the adjacent property and uh, include a follow-up inspection um, six to nine months down the road after the printing. Great, uh, John, I see your hand. Yeah, I've, I, I've never done this, uh, but I think from Larry, I'm getting that a, a, a friendly amendment could maybe uh, add something to that. And if so, what I'd like to add to, to exactly what uh, Larry said was that the, um, the, 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 the city, uh, uh, try to uh, accommodate the pruning of this tree uh, 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 on as expedited a, a, a time scale uh, as they could. So if they could check out their their schedule and and see if if this thing could be pushed pushed up a little bit uh, based on the concerns. I I accept that amendment. And I second the motion as amended. Great, we have a, uh, a motion with an amendment uh, and I'll start at the top of the roll. Uh, Jim Kramer. Aye. Tracy DeWitt. Aye. Larry Gunther. Aye. John Reuter. Aye. David Robinson. Aye. And Colin Walsh, aye. I think, is this, we have one more, is that right, Rob? One more, should be easy, easy peasy, hopefully. Um, this is a pear tree that's oh, got- it, May it, I just, one sec, uh, yeah. for the, for the uh, uh, individual who brought the, who was representing the owners of the property, uh, just to note, uh, any decision of the tree commission can be appealed to city council. My apologies for interrupting, Rob. No problem, no problem, it's a good point and good information. Um, so the pear tree, this pear tree has a large amount of mistletoe all throughout it and fire blight and infections. If you go to the first slide, please. And so there's the tree. Um, next slide shows it does have some limb failures and um, the next slide shows there you can see the mistletoe um, kind of in the front of the picture that's all mistletoe there and, and riddled throughout the rest of uh, the tree. So due to the, the mistletoe and fire blight, and you can go one more slot. Oh, I left that out where it's planted right up against the fence, but um, that's kind of irrespective of the condition of the tree with the mistletoe and fire blight that uh, re recommending removal and replacement of the tree uh, along the Angela Street or the Cal Boulevard Street side of the, of the property. Thank you, Rob. Uh, are there any clarifying questions from uh, commissioners? Not seeing any, uh, let's take public comment. Please 
uh, press star nine if you're on the phone or raise your hand, press the raise your hand button if you're in Zoom to create, to make a public comment. I do not see any uh, raised hands for this public comment. Thank you. Um, is there any uh, discussion, uh, Larry? Uh, I would move that we follow staff recommendations and remove and replace this tree. Great, we have a motion. Jim, I see your hand too. Uh, just a quick question for Rob, I guess. Um, can, as part of the process of removal, can the mistletoe be harvested and sold at farmer's market? <laughs> I will email you when uh, the tree's coming down. You're more than happy to harvest it any time between now and tree removal and sell it at your leisure. Cool. All right, we have a motion and a second and uh, a, pen, a potential revenue stream. Uh, so, Jim, I see your hand. Did you, oh, it's, you're down oh. now. You're, are you good? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, so then I'll call on you to vote. Jim? Aye. Tracy DeWitt? Aye. Larry Gunther? Aye. John Ruder? Aye. David Robinson? Aye. And Colin Walsh? Aye. Um, I see your hand, Larry. Is there? Yeah, it's definitely after the vote. Um, so. I just am, um, it seems in the last several meetings, we've had fewer Chinese tallow and aristocrat pears. And I hope that means we're moving beyond those species into um, better species in the city. Yeah. Uh, so the before we take our next item, uh, we've been meeting for two hours. Uh, I'd like to take a brief uh, recess so everyone can be fresh. So a uh, five minute recess. Sounds good.
when uh, David, Larry, and Tracy, if you're back, please let us know. I'm back. I'm here. Great. And uh, Rob, are you back too? Yep, I'm here. Great. And uh, Will, I see you there too. Um, well, uh, Sherry and Matt, thank you so much for waiting through uh, all of those uh, tree deliberations. So our next item is the Davis Innovation and Sustainability Campus uh, 2022 DISC 2022, although it's supposed to be a lowercase i, right? Yeah. Um, so the for the next item, uh, as we go through this, uh, Sherry's going to make a presentation, going to give us an introduction. Uh, uh, Matt Kiesling uh, from the project development team will make a presentation. Uh, and then we will have an opportunity to ask clarifying questions. Uh, we'll then take public comment, and then we'll move into deliberation uh, and discussion about the item. Uh, the subcommittee has put forward some recommendations that uh, were sent around to everybody and posted on the website. Um, if it seems like we're ready at that point, to, we can put those up on the screen and uh, edit uh, the past recommendations, the, the subcommittee recommendations, and move towards um, new recommendations. We have uh, the we have some time constraints in addressing this. The city council has given us two weeks. So if we don't finish tonight, we would need to have a special meeting within the next two two weeks uh, in order to to complete this. Uh, and unfortunately, the subcommittee has been able to meet and uh, look at things. Um, are the just one caveat is that the recommendations that you received from the subcommittee were from discussions from prior to receiving all of the uh, new material from the developer that was included in the staff report. Uh, just by necessity, in order to get it out in a timely way and have it posted, we had to make uh, recommendations based on the other information in the project. The subcommittee did meet again on Saturday and may have some further uh, information as well. Um, so the one other thing I just want to note is we're not being asked and Sherry will probably cover this. We're not being asked to talk about traffic. We're not being asked to talk about economic development or you know, that we love or hate development at Davis. We're being asked to talk about trees in the project. Uh, probably no surprise to tree commissioners that we're being asked to talk about trees. So I see your, your hand, Larry. And then uh, I, after that, I wanna turn it over to Sherry. Yeah, I just, uh, I wanted to make that point that I, in one of the public comment we received via email that um, we are not deciding on this project and for now we are making recommendations about trees. Um, and just on behalf of everybody present, including staff and the presenters, um, I just want to ask the commissioners to be efficient. I'm not trying to squelch conversation, but if we can make this efficient, um, that would be awesome. Great. And I think Sherry has some good ideas for uh, helping us do that. So, and uh, I'd like to turn it over to you, Sherry. Thank you, Chair Walsh. Good evening, everybody. Uh, as I'm sure pretty much everybody, you know, you don't have any new members, right? Oh, we, there's everybody? one in the audience. Okay. We have a, 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 a soon to be member in the audience and we have members that are new since the last time the project was okay. uh, reviewed, although one of them is not here tonight. Okay, okay. Well, I, I thought maybe this was gonna be one of the few commissions that didn't have new members, but I guess I'm wrong about that. Well, anyway, last year um, at uh, roughly the same time, DISC, the original DISC project was brought before the Tree Commission for review and comment. Ultimately, that project was approved by the City Council. However, it was not approved by the electorate. In July of this year, the applicant reapplied for this new project that we call DISC 2022. 
It has similar land uses, but is approximately half the size of the original project. Recently, the City Council approved Resolution 21-131, which outlined the processing stages for the DISC 2022 project. In it, the City Council directed each of the listed commissions to review their previous DISC recommendations and to make any necessary edits, deletions, or amendments based on the new project. Furthermore, the City Council directed that this review occur in one meeting, as the Chair mentioned, and if that was not possible, then any continued meeting date be within two weeks of today. So first, you're going to hear a presentation by the applicant's representative, Mr. Matt Keesling. And then when the chair decides that we're ready, I have prepared a copy of your uh, tree commission committee recommendations. And it is in a format where I can put it up on the screen and we will be then able to make edits uh, live and in, as you can see the screen and in person, I guess you might call it. So I will share my screen. The chair will introduce each numbered recommendation and then you can deliberate whatever changes you want to make or whether you want to leave it the same or delete it all together or whatever you wish to recommend. I will reflect those changes in the list and then we move on to the next one. So you have about 21, I think, individual recommendations that we need to go through. And uh, I know that it's possible for you all to get through them. I know that the subcommittee has spent quite a bit of time deliberating the recommendations. And so once they are finished, um, we will forward those on to the Planning Commission and the City Council. Oh, one last thing I forgot to mention. Once we get through the entire list, then I would suggest that the Commission as a whole take a vote on the list as a whole so that it becomes your official recommendation. So uh, with that, I will, if it's okay with the Chair, I'll turn it over to Matt Keesling. Please. Welcome, Matt. Thank you, Chair and Tree Commissioners. Thank you for having us here tonight. As Ms. Metzger mentioned, my name is Matt Kiesling. I'm with Taylor and Wiley here on behalf of the property owner tonight and applicant Ramco Enterprises. Uh, Dan apologizes for not being here. He had a family event he had to attend, but he, he asked me to uh, make sure that we are here to make sure the commission understands the revised project and, and be able to answer any questions you might have. Um, so I do have a PowerPoint prepared, but since um, Chair Walsh, you mentioned that there are a couple new members, I'm gonna start at a little higher level if that's okay. And I'd actually like to just start with identifying where the project site is in case the new uh, commissioners don't know. Uh, the DISC 2022 property is, this is the Mace Drainage Channel. This is Alhambra and Mace Boulevard. This is Second Street and Mace Boulevard. And the property is located here adjacent to the city on its eastern edge. This is Ikeda's market down at the bottom. Um, so that gives you a sense of, of where this is located. And it is within the unincorporated county of Yolo, um, but adjacent to the city of Davis. So part of this application would require annexation of the property into the city of Davis, along with putting a general plan designation and zoning on the property. So I will now jump to PowerPoint. And I just wanna start with uh, reiterating something Sherry mentioned. This project responded to a city's request for, um, for expressions of interest that was put out in the summer of 2014. Um, and the DISC project first came forward at, at, at that point. Um, and the city asked property owners to come forward with a proposal to move forward with an innovation center something that would capitalize upon the knowledge-based economy of Davis and be a place to grow future employment-related uses uh, within the city of Davis. There were originally three respondents to that RFEI, uh, with this project being the last of the three that's, that's continued through the process. One of them actually withdrew and eventually became the Woodland Innovation Center, and the other is um, uh, has not come back with another proposal. So, 
We uh, have been in the process for quite some time. In the summer of 2020, the project received unanimous approval from the city council and was placed on the ballot for November of 2020, um, where it was defeated, um, but by a small margin. Um, after, the, after the election results came out, we took some time to really sit back and reflect. The property owners had some good discussions. Um, you know, thought about whether it made sense to continue on, whether it made sense to continue to pursue this, uh, looked at the election results, looked at, looked at how far they'd come down the road, and Ramco and Oates, who owned this 100 acres, decided that they would believe in this project and they wanted to give it another go. We've had some wonderful conversations with, with the business community, particularly biotech and ag tech industries, you're seeing a great deal of activity, despite the fact that we've been in a pandemic for the last 18 months. These industries have been booming right through it, and the demand has been has been incredible. And so Ramco and Oates said, you know, we still believe in this. We think it's the right location. We know that companies want to be next to UC Davis and the research taking place there. Let's take another run at it. Um, meanwhile, they went and had a conversation with their partners to the north. Um, which is Reynolds and Brown. They own the 87 acres located north of this project site. And they said, you know, we want to we want to give it another try. Are you in? And Reynolds and Brown, quite frankly, said, we have projects other places. They have a lot of large developments in the East Bay and the South Bay, as well as in the Lathrop area. And they simply said, we don't have the resources to, to put into this again. We are going to put our energies other places. We wish you luck. Um, and at that point, we resubmitted with this revised application which is DISC 2022. As you can see a comparison here, you can see the project that was approved by council last year. Um, it was 194 acres. The revised project is now 102 acres. Um, previously, the Mace drainage channel ran through the center of the project site. It now is the Northern border of the project site. Um, and quite frankly, though we are sad to not be moving forward with Reynolds and Brown, we do think that the revised project is what Dan likes to call Davis sized. I mean, it, it really listened to what we heard from the voters, um, concerns that it was just too much growth, that there may not be demand for all of it, though we believe the demand is there, but it seemed at 194 acres to be, well, larger than anything Davis has approved in the last 45 years. So coming in at 102 acres feels like um, it's, it's a more appropriate size, and we believe the project will build out over the course of the next decade to 15 years. Uh, this is an overall land plan on, on how we envision the land uses at this site to, to look. And this is the site master plan that we're putting forward. You can see um, the light blue is office, laboratory, and R&D. The pink is advanced manufacturing. The yellow is a residential component that is intended to serve as residences for the people that are working at this site primarily. And then the green is our park and open space and the ag buffer goes around the exterior. In the Southwest corner, we have an, um, a 150 room hotel with convention center. Um, and out on Mace Boulevard, you can see that there is, I don't know if my cursor would work, we have a transit plaza. So just a, a couple of things that I would point out that have changed. Most of you know this project. One thing in particular, in our last iteration, we had a lot of talks with the Rec and Park Commission about the fact that our main park was here on Mason Alhambra. And they had concerns about having a, um, a park that included a lot of recreational activities adjacent to what is a rather busy street. Uh, we took that to heart, and when we came back with this revised site plan, we took the opportunity to take that park and move it to the center of the project, which actually we think is a better location, and it serves now more as what we think is the quad to our campus. We also had many conversations with, with several different transit advocates, as well as YCTD and Unitrans, about the location of our transit plaza, which used to be internal to the project site. At almost 200 acres and nearly 6,000 jobs, we had a critical mass that would have um, that would have warranted transit at build out coming internal to the site. So the transit plaza made sense at that location. However, at 100 acres, we believe that it is more appropriate to keep that transit plaza on Mace, that we will not route buses off their existing routes and instead have it on Mace. 
And the way that we've designed this now, it allows for four buses to stack at once and be able to get out of our transit plaza back onto Mace Boulevard to turn left on Alhambra. We've met with YCTD now twice about the project. Um, they are very pleased with the location. And I think probably Alan Hirsch, when he comments, will let you know that that was always his preference anyway. So I'm happy to say, Alan, you have your transit plaza on Mace Boulevard. Um, the other major change you'll see is in response to COVID. So in the previous iterations of this project, commercial laboratory and R&D space was roughly two thirds of the square footage and advanced manufacturing, manufacturing was about a third. Um, what we've all seen is that a lot of traditional office users are shifting over to flex schedules um, where people are able to work remotely multiple days a week, um, maybe not even needing to come into the office at all, except for once or twice a week to check in on regular meetings. And so the demand for office has gone down. While that demand for office has gone down, the demand for R&D and advanced manufacturing has been booming. And so we adjusted the plans accordingly. It is now 50-50, so 550,000 square feet of office, laboratory and R&D, 550,000 square feet of advanced manufacturing. And those are pretty much the major changes. Otherwise, these are the same land uses, the same parks, the same greenways as you saw um, when we came through here just about a year and a half ago. Here is our recreation open space and park and ag buffer exhibit. Just see there is roughly 14 acres that runs around the north and eastern sides of the property, um, separating this project site from the adjacent agriculture. We have six acres of true park within. Uh, the larger park serving as more of a community park. It will be have lit softball fields. Um, it will have, uh, we've designed it actually to accommodate multiple different sports. Uh, we actually had it laid out so that we could fit a cricket field with both a soccer field and a rugby field in the outfield. Um, we've heard from Rec and Park that they would also like to see some lacrosse. Design of that park hasn't been worked out, but absolutely um, a lit softball field will be involved in it. And then we have the interior courtyards to both the office component as well as the residential components. This is a cross section of what we envision the ag buffers will look like at this site. Uh, we have the internal 50 feet on the far right, which is an activated area. We have class one bike trails, walking paths, uh, predominantly native species. You can anticipate there will be benches, lights, and signage to indicate what you're looking at in various directions. The external 100 feet of the ag buffer is not to be occupied by people. Uh, it's primarily for habitat. It also will serve a drainage purpose. Uh, the site does drain within the ag buffer up to the Mace Channel. And um, that is one of the major changes. Last time we came to you, there was a lot of discussion about tree planting and how much could be accommodated on site. A good percentage of that was anticipated to be within the agricultural buffer. So I do think it's important to note, this probably for the subcommittee in particular, that our ag buffer now on the northern boundary, which is our largest portion of ag buffer, the Mace drainage channel runs right through the middle of that. And so area that was previously appropriate for say an oak savanna with, with valley oaks um, is now going to be riparian habitat. And what we've proposed is to keep the Mace drainage corridor there because it needs to drain all of East Davis, but building a shelf along the edge and bringing in a true riparian habitat value to it. So trees in that area will be more geared towards a riparian environment and, and there will be less area for it because the drainage canal needs to be there and continuing to function. Um, nevertheless, it will continue to serve habitat value. Just so you see what I'm talking about, this is the existing mace drainage channel. You can see there are a couple of cottonwoods that are growing on the far end of the property. I think we have a total of four trees on the site at the moment. Um, I, that's important to note as well. This property has been in tomatoes for several, several years. I think they've also had safflower out there. Um, but there are not many trees on site at all. So any trees we're talking about tonight are a net benefit to the urban canopy. Um, it's, it's really devoid of trees at the moment. Um, instead, that internal 50 feet, just some examples of what that might look like as we start to develop it out. Class one bike trails, you all know what those look like, interfacing with the adjacent agriculture. This is our um, main central park feature. You can see that we've got the softball field. The way they've laid it out is you have the softball field in the 
uh, southeast corner or what would be the north in this picture. And I wish I could get my cursor to go up there. I don't know if you all can see that, but I cannot. There's the softball field, uh, which would be lit. And then you have the, the pitch for cricket. And within these portions, actually of both the outfield for the softball field and the outfield for the cricket field, you can fit in one or two soccer fields as well as rugby or, or lacrosse. We also have a commercial component within the parks. Uh, we're showing some pickleball. Again, this is all conceptual, assuming that we are approved by the voters. Uh, the actual park design does come back to the city for review and would go through the commission process and eventually to the planning commission. This is an example of what it might look like with the commercial feature in the middle of the park, a place where we can bring the community together, gather, have a bite to eat, enjoy the outdoors and the beautiful weather that we have here in Davis. Hopefully sit under some nice trees that are mature at that point. Moving on, um, parking lots. The way we have addressed parking is that we will meet the city's 50% shade requirements within parking lots, but we are uh, proposing that the shading be achieved through both photovoltaics as well as trees. Um, we know that this is a delicate balance to be struck. Um, would happy to hear your comments and assume that you might have some recommendations on that. But we have made some rather large and aggressive sustainability commitments. And in fact, this site is, if approved, will be one of the most sustainable, if not the most sustainable business centers anywhere in the country. Um, and a lot of that is because of the amount of photovoltaic um, energy that we believe can be generated on site and renewable energy on site. So we do have the option to cover all of our parking lots with PV. Um, but also want to be sure that we find a delicate balance and make sure that trees are a part of that as well for all of the many climate benefits they bring to the table as well. So um, we're working on that, but hitting shading requirements being our key objective and our key driver. Also in our landscaping is drought tolerant. We uh, have committed to being predominantly drought tolerant native species, all within the ag buffer would be native and drought tolerant. Um, drought tolerant then will predominate throughout, though you may have some ornamental species that are throughout in a more commercial environment type setting as you get into the interior of the center, but that will be our focus. We've also made commitments not to utilize turf other than where it's needed for recreational purposes, so it, in the large recreational park, um, but avoiding turf and avoiding things that are um, large water users. We're looking for plantings that are really appropriate for Davis and appropriate for this, this climate and this environment. Which leads me to my next slide. We had a great meeting with Tree Davis and a couple of representatives from Tree Davis, including the president of the board and the executive director, and had a good discussion about what's going on in Davis right now with the tree canopy, adding to the urban canopy and what they wanna see moving forward. That conversation actually led to a, a pretty robust discussion of climate ready landscapes, which we think is interesting. Um, and, and told them we wanna come back and have some additional conversations. But really thinking about the emphasis so far has been on native species, drought tolerant species, which is right. But this thought of what was native here 50 years ago might not continue to be the appropriate tree 50 years from now. And since the lifetime of the trees we intend to plant at this location is gonna be you know, 50, 100 years, we need to be thinking about what the future climate looks like and making sure that the species that we're planting are not only appropriate for today and not only natives that may have been appropriate here in the last 100 years, but making sure that they're going to work for the next 100 years. So I want you to know that that's also something that we are in discussions about and thinking about as we move forward with the landscaping at this site. Um, so here are some examples that, that we've been looking at as to how to have natural landscapes, avoiding turf, bringing drought tolerant in, creating a variety of, of atmospheres um, and including recreational purposes under the enjoyment of trees. We also have a commitment that all of our bike and walking paths will be under um, canopy that achieves 80% shading, um, which is a, a pretty aggressive shading standard. We worked with you last time we came through and we're sticking to that commitment and we still hold to that commitment. We believe that is an appropriate standard and, and we will hit it. And I think actually that probably is a good way to pivot into some of these commitments that we've made previously, though. I know we sent you a more robust list as, as, as part of a chart, but 
when we were here in 2020, I think it was early 2020, um, there was a lot of discussion about how many trees should be forced upon to this site, what was appropriate. We had a big back and forth about really how many trees could a project accommodate. Um, and, and I think we hit a number that, that was sort of a compromise number. Um, the tree commission had asked us for, for a larger number and we were at a smaller number and we met somewhere in the middle and committed to a certain number of trees. But, you know, as the developer, when we stepped away, we said, you know, it always felt premature and a bit artificial to be talking about how many trees would we commit to and how many trees are we going to say, absolutely, we will have this many trees. Um, because really what the focus ought to be on is planting the right trees in the right place to achieve long-term tree health and the overall canopy that we all want and the shading that we want from those trees. And it shouldn't be about hitting some arbitrary number that we all make up, but it should be about making sure that the site is treated appropriately, that those trees are healthy, and that it's achieving the outcomes that we want from the trees. And so what we've said this time coming back, and, and I, you know, we had a good discussion with uh, folks from Tree Davis on this too, is that our main goal is not to say we're going to plant a thousand trees or we're going to plant 500 trees or we're going to plant 5,000 trees, but it's that we want to make sure that we're planting trees in an appropriate manner that's going to hit that 80% shade coverage on those trails, that's going to hit 50% shade coverage on the streets and in the parking areas, and that's going to be planted in the way that ensures that those trees grow, that they grow healthy, and that they stay strong and that they're managed in that fashion so that we keep that shade coverage and maybe even exceed that shade coverage and we have a healthy urban forest and a healthy canopy at disk. And so our top bullet point here on our commitments is to achieve an appropriate shade coverage for the different land use types, which are spelled out more clearly in certain commitments, that we utilize the best practices for tree planting and root establishment that we utilize planting practices to assure tree health that's subject to the third party verification. This was a big deal last time we went through. We agreed to that in the development agreement. And those commitments are still there. That we achieve our shading objectives within 15 years. That third party verification comes out and verifies that we've met it. That third party actually comes out and monitors our tree growth so that early on in the process, we identify trees that are not performing and we can either remove and replace them or decide what steps need to be taken to get that tree to perform. Um, we've agreed to those things in the DA and I'm happy to tell you tree commissioners that our commitments that were made last time have not shifted. Everything that we committed to you last time other than some, than a number is still there. Um, and and we're, we're committed to trees. We had many meetings with the Lorax. Um, he pushed us in, in ways that we hadn't been before and got us to go places that I don't think we had thought about, but that we ended up committing to in the DA. Um, and I think in two different meetings at, at the Tree Commission, you all did the same. Um, we were pretty pleased with where our commitments ended up and, and we're gonna stand by those. Um, and with that, I will end with this as an aerial image of our site. Um, this is the artist rendition of what DISC 2022 would look like at full build out. So this would be 10 to 15 years from now, uh, given the size of some of those trees, I'm gonna say probably more like 20 years from now. Um, but you can see a good use of PV on the rooftops, uh, trees that are achieving the shading along the walkways and the pedestrian paths, um, still including space for recreation and photovoltaics, um, and really creating a place where Davis can continue to foster innovation, continue to grow businesses, and allow businesses that either spring from the research at UCD or collaborate with the research at UCD to be located here in close proximity to the university so that we continue to have that tech transfer, to have this transfer of ideas and growth of ideas, getting things that are theoretic at the university and turning them into actual products that go to market from Davis. Um, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions and um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Matt. Um, so I guess as we go through uh, clarifying questions, 
I expect there's a fair number of clarifying questions. Um, and I, I want to approach it a little differently than we've been doing meetings where we raise hands. And I, I want to just kind of go down the list uh, so everybody sort of knows they have a turn. We can have go backs if we need to, but um, let's let's kind of take it in an orderly way down the list. Um, Jim, you're at the top of the list, but if you want to pass, I'm, I know that uh, the mm -hmm. subcommittee members are have comments prepared as well. So I want to give you the opportunity to either take the to be first or to pass to someone else. Well, I have I have one question um, in terms of uh, planting trees in the appropriate place and so on. I've seen uh, a number of examples proposed where solar panels are built on uh, freeway midstream, mid, mid places or over uh, uh, water canals and so on. I'm wondering if some of the PV solar panels could be placed over the drainage ditch, freeing up uh, space in the parking lots for more trees. Chair, yeah. is that a question for the applicant? Yeah. Please, uh, applicant, uh, please, Matt, if you'd like to respond. Um, I would say that I've not heard that before. <laughs> um, it is very intriguing. Um, so one of the commitments that we've made is utilizing the agricultural buffer areas for primarily habitat values. Um, and so there was a strong push by some of the other commissions to not have PV within the outer 150 feet of the ag buffer, um, which would mean that in this case, that would include the maize drainage channel. Um, however, you know, we are working with, with um, some local experts. Uh, I, I, um, Chris Sutterquist from Cool Davis has been kind of consulting with us on where we can do PV and how to do PV. And I'm happy to discuss that issue with him. Uh, quite frankly, this is the first time I've actually heard of that. Um, so we will happily research it and look into it, but it's an intriguing place to put it since no trees can grow there. Great. Sherry, I'm seeing you raise your hand physically. Are you wanting to say something? Uh, I just wanted to add that uh, the rules about creation of these ag buffers when it comes to an annexation project are pretty specific about what can and cannot go within the ag buffer. And to the best of my recollection, I don't recall there being any allowances for, for uh, solar panels or, or over any kind of a solar array that would go in the ag buffer. As Mr. Keesling mentioned, I think the general idea is to make it into a, almost like a, a natural uh, setting like you might find um, in California 150 years ago, something like that. Um, of course, minus the, the drainage ditch. But um, I don't recall there being any, any allowances for facilities like that. But I, I would say also, Sherry, that, that, that drainage channel actually serves as the main drainage for all of East Davis. So um, maintenance on it um, happens annually, if not more than once a year. So they do go out and kind of ensure that that is continuing to function as appropriate. So we'd have to be careful about the ability to continue to get vehicles in there as well to ensure the ongoing functionality of the drainage ditch. Um, but I don't know either that they're flat out precluded in the outer 100, uh, 100 feet of the ag buffer. Um, well, let's, let's not take more time on that. It was just a, a question. You can think about it. Great. Larry, I'm seeing your hand. Do you, is there something that you want to jump in before we get to you? Well, actually, something not that I want to jump into. I thought it actually is a really good time to hear a hopefully very brief um, comment from the subcommittee on the changes uh, since last since Saturday, since your meeting Saturday. Ah, okay. Uh, John or Tracy. Uh, is, would you like to take that? Well, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, you know, Colin, if I can make a comment, I would, um, I'd like to be able to ask some, uh, some, some clarifying questions uh, before we get to that. Uh, 
a lot, I believe uh, some of the recommendations we had, we were a little bit uh, loose on them at this point because we didn't know what the project was gonna look like and we didn't have a chance to ask these questions. So I would, um, uh, I personally would prefer to be able to ask some, uh, some, 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 some clarifying questions so that our recommendations can be put into a better context. That sounds great. Great. Um, and I can, I guess one thing I would know, uh, just to like give a, a sense of the difference of the information we had before the agenda came out on Friday versus the information after the agenda came out on Friday uh, is that within the documents about uh, DISC 2022 on the city website that we are looking at, the, the word tree did not appear. So the word tree didn't appear in any documents until the agenda. So it was a pretty significant, it was, it, it was a lot of new information, although a lot of it is similar to what came out at the tree commission at, this, at the same time last time. We just didn't know what it would be. Uh, but with that, um, shall we continue down the list uh, if there's clarifying questions and Tracy DeWitt would be next. Well, thank you very much, um, Chair Walsh. And thank you, Mr. Kiesling for being here this evening and for sharing all that great information. Um, like you said, this was something that the city was requesting and you guys were trying to make it happen. And I have respect for that. Um, but um, I do have a lot of um, concerns about this presentation. Um, the, one of the main things that is um, obvious to me is that in the uh, original proposal, um, as, we, as, you, as you've described, it's basically cut in half. Um, and you had committed to at least 1,800 trees, and then now you're committing to maybe something close to nothing. Um, and so the only thing is that you want to plant the right tree in the right location for the desired shade. Um, there's, I, I, I have a, a an, um, there is this assumption that there is a conflict between trees and solar. When I think that this should not be of concern because trees are um, far more than just shade. So to reduce trees to the metric of shade is really a disservice to our community. And I think that this being an innovation center, which is where you want to come up with new or all renewed or altered ideas or methods or products designed to save energy. I think that trees provide solutions to some of our most pressing energy challenges. Yet, um, that is not reflected in this um, innovation technology center. I would hope that maybe in the future, this place would be able to come up with some um, technology, maybe that's seen by NASA to adapt some way for measuring the above ground biomass so that trees are not simply reduced to their ability to um, sequester carbon or shade, but they actually do far more than that. Um, so regarding your specific um, uh, proposal here, can you please um, address the word assessment in your report where you state, I was, um, well, you say the assessment of the project site has determined that it can accommodate you know, 600 to 1200 trees. So is it possible to get access to that assessment? Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, yeah, um, thank you, uh, Commissioner, for the, for the question there. Um, I, I, I think I wanna start by clarifying that um, we believe trees provide a lot more than just shade. Um, we know that trees provide um, all kinds of benefits, both to mental health as well as physical health. 
Um, and, and we believe trees play an important role in every subdivision. Um, you know, this is, this is an area that, that embraces its trees. Um, so I, I just want to point out that we believe that trees provide a lot more than just simply being a, sh a shade. Um, I, I, think, I think the reason we didn't put a number, and I will say I, I do have a report and we'd be happy to submit it. Uh, what we did is we actually asked a, a certified landscape architect to take a look at our site, uh, the revised project site plan, uh, taking into account the roads, the square footages, the parking areas, the requirements to have a certain amount of shading, um, in all areas. So basically 80% of all trails, walkways, pedestrian walkways and streets that you would hit 50% shading of parking areas as well as, as driving roadways. And then we also asked him to take into consideration the amount of acres within the ag buffer, recognizing however, that there might be constraints associated with the maize drainage channel and to back taking all of those things into account to take a rough look at our site and say, how many trees could we accommodate on site? And then we actually threw in variables and said, if we fully maximize solar in the parking lots and didn't put trees, how many trees would we have on site? If we didn't have any solar at all in the parking areas, how many trees would we have on site? And so he actually gave us a, a nice range is what it came out to. And his range basically said that um, if there was no solar component at all on the site, he thought to have trees that hit their maximum capacity with with having a good canopy size of the varieties that were identified um, through the commission process last time, he thought we would have somewhere between 800 and 1200 trees on site. He said, however, if you were to utilize massive amounts of solar in those parking areas, that number is probably more likely to be somewhere between 600 and 900 trees on site. He said a lot that factors in also is what is the design of the homes? What is the actual footprint of the buildings? How exactly will the parking areas be designed? And so there are so many variables and where we are in the process right now is seeking annexation, a general plan designation and a zoning designation. And then all of the precise design of site comes back in subsequent entitlements. We come back through for final PD. We have to have a design guidelines. We have to have landscaping plans. We have to go through a mapping process. This is, shall we say the tip of the iceberg that decides is there a disc or not? And if there is a disc, then there are several additional stages that we go through of a planning process where I think we will really drill down on that number. Um, so what, what we then through conversations with landscape professionals, um, as well as Tree Davis, um, had a discussion of what's a better metric for us to commit to at this point, since we know so many variables play into how many trees are going to be on site. Does it make sense at all for us to be say, pull a rabbit out of a hat and say, let's just go with a thousand because that sounds neat. And we said, no, let's not do that. Let's not, you know, let's not pretend. Let's instead shoot for something that's tangible. And so what we wanted to really focus on was how do we ensure that the trees we do plant, when we do plant them, are planted in the right way and that we're ensuring their health and that we're ensuring that we're maximizing the benefits that we get from those trees, which, which we know is definitely more than just shade. So I, I do want to be clear, we are not trying to shirk our commitments to trees, but we're trying to approach it in a fashion that we think is more honest and is going to get better results. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Tracy, do you have more questions? Well, thank you for, for the opportunity and thank you for the answer. Um, I, I don't find that not, I, I, I do find that having a number is more tangible than not having a number. I just want to point that out. Um, and you say that you embrace trees, but as Colin stated, there wasn't one word about trees. Um, the trees are, are pretty much just um, 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 shade. That's pretty much how they're being um, treated in this development. And not that's not to any fault of you, know, you guys. I think it's been tradition. Um, but you know, now we have the option of solar and that brings me to another question is, has solar been looked at on rooftops and in other areas? And um, why is it just in parking lots where it's uh, taking up uh, soil? Um, you know, solar can live in other places, trees can only live in soil. Um, so you say that you embrace it, but I just don't see anything that isn't even directing your in that. And then, oh, let's look at this photo here, that park 
when we were zoomed in on that park, I think just in the time that you were talking, I counted nearly 100 trees just surrounding that one photo. So I think that your photos are incredibly misleading. So your photos and your words tonight say, you know, that oh, we support trees and trees have more value than just their shade. But yet in the document, really, there is just no commitment to trees whatsoever. And it's just basically reduced to trees or solar to meet the shade requirements. Um, thank you. So Chair, would you like yes. a response to that? Was there a question to that? I, th I think I heard a question about, did we explore putting solar on rooftops as opposed yeah. to just parking areas? So yeah. I do yeah. wanna say, first of all, we're at the Natural Resources Commission next week. Um, and yes, we have explored solar anywhere and everywhere we can explore solar. We actually have a commitment to put solar on every rooftop that can accommodate it. So we didn't just, think about it on rooftops, we fully committed to putting it on every feasible rooftop we can put it on. Um, but we also wanna keep open an opportunity to put it in parking areas as well. And we do understand that there needs to be a delicate balance. Um, and we're hoping that maybe some of your recommendations to council will address what that appropriate balance might be. Um, and I just, I'm, I'm not sure if it was a question, but I'm going to respond. I think you're right. Um, I think you're right that our application did not talk about trees as much as it probably should have. And I will say that I've done a lot of these in the last 16 years. And I don't know that unless we're trying to preserve a tree that's on site, we almost never talk about trees when we put in our application. Um, and it's probably because as, as a land use professional, you're thinking about zoning and entitlements and you're seeking the right to do something on your site that usually isn't otherwise already allowed. Um, and so typically you're talking about the built environment. And that's what your focus is on, is on the structures and the uses that will occur within those structures. Um, and that's probably, that's probably a mistake from, from not just us, but from planners in general. Um, so I thank you for that comment. And I think we'll take that to heart. And, and I'll tell you that the next time I submit an application, I think it deserves a section on trees as we talk about it. Because, you know, like I said, in the entitlement process, those are details that usually come at a later stage, um, but they shouldn't be overlooked and they shouldn't be ignored. So thanks for the comment. Thank you, Matt. So just to remind everybody, we want to, uh, at this point in the meeting, we want to stick to clarifying questions and uh, keep uh, and less of opinion statements and, and uh, deliberation will come after public comment. So, uh, and Tracy, did you have more questions or are we ready to move to, to Larry? Um, okay, yes, and I'm so sorry about that. Um, I, I, um, I will, I guess I don't really have any clarifying questions at this time, thank you. Thank you so much, Tracy. Larry? Yeah, so a quick one. Um, oh, let me put my glasses back on, that'll help. Um, just the advanced manufacturing. Um, I know there are a lot of laws about emissions and, you know, ventilation. There, there are huge, huge sections on the code, but um, just kind of a general description of advanced manufacturing, what that is, and specifically for tonight, what effect that has on the immediate environment as far as, you know, emissions and of heat and or uh, other gases and therefore how it affects trees. I'll just go there. Thanks. Sure. Um, so advanced manufacturing versus typical manufacturing. Um, and advanced manufacturing is not manufacturing, um, say a tractor, right? We're, we're not doing a trip, typical manufacturing facility, which is your run of the mill product, but advanced manufacturing usually involves some sort of um, robotics are some sort of, of um, uh, a chemical composition, something that's, that's more, it's, it's, it's not your run of the mill. It involves some sort of science base that is associated with it. And usually the products that come out of advanced manufacturing is you're creating few products that have a large value versus manufacturing multiple, very small products on bulk. Uh, it's a simple way, I think, to explain it. 
Um, it's similar to what you see in Davis already with Schilling Robotics and Morisaki are great examples of advanced manufacturing that already takes place in town, um, right? Um, how it impacts the environment there. I mean, manufacturing is intensive. It's, it's, it's power intensive. Um, it often involves gases. Um, however, the Davis has one of the most aggressive codes of any place in the state with your reach code. And we committed to utilize the reach code, which is incredibly sustainable and sustainable and designed to ensure that our buildings maximize sustainability features. Um, and so we're committed to that. I think what you will see here in the realm of advanced manufacturing will be about the most sustainable advanced manufacturing structures anywhere in the nation, um, given the commitments that we made last time through and we're still sticking with. Great, thank you. And then, yeah, I, I just, a, it is a comment, but just the, the, the trees aren't part of the initial plan is why they often get ended up they end up getting kind of short shrift. And so, I mean, it's with anything. If you don't put it into the initial planning, it comes on afterward as a bolt on it. Anyway, that's, those are the only, that's the only clarifying question I had. Thank you so much. That was a, that was a very clear answer, by the way. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, great. Uh, so the next questions, uh, John uh, Ruder, would you like to ask any clarifying questions? Yes, I would. Uh, um, uh, Matt, thanks. It was a, it was a very nice uh, presentation. I just want to let you know that I'm a member of that subcommittee, so there are some things that I've been thinking about for a while, uh, and and hopefully you could you could give some some answers too. Um, first, I, I I absolutely agree uh, with you that the uh, that if you look at that site from an aerial view, especially, I mean there are no trees there. I mean, maybe there's a handful of trees, you know, but uh, uh, but for any project to add to add trees, I I I, I think it is great. So uh, I think it comes down to a matter of uh, what they'll look like and and what their density is and what part of the project can can accommodate those trees. So. So let me get to my first uh, topic, and I don't know. There, there are five sub sub points that I want to bring up. I'm not quite sure how to seamlessly ask this uh, of you. So maybe I could just ask you if you do me a favor. Uh, I'm just going to give you five quick little words or topics, phrases, and 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 if you can write that down in the questions, I'm going to ask you to be thinking about all these things as we as, as we go along because they they are they are interrelated and it wouldn't be fair to just talk to one to the exclusion of the other. Okay. Is that okay with you? Sounds fun. Okay, so it's it all these fall under the general category of the ag uh, buffer zone. Okay, so the first one are restrictions of what can be placed in there. Uh, the whole issue of the, the, the drainage area, the drainage canal and trees. Uh, the vision for the east side buffer zone, uh, the design of the uh, right riparian area, and um, achieving uh, your visions on achieving more of a, a forest in quotes forest like view than just what what I'll call the uh, the lollipop uh, effect. You know, and uh, in in your last drawing, the rendering there 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 was that 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 little little lollipop effect. Okay, um, just to, just as another just side thing to that, if you drive down Route uh, Route, route One Hundred and Two, there are a number of areas like hedge, hedgerows, I'll call them, uh, for back of letter, lack of better, where they actually look like a, a little forest in the middle of a field. They're just not rows of, of pear trees or rows of maples or rows of what what have you. So I'm just wondering if you could get into the vision, the concept of this whole ag buffer, perhaps uh, uh, picking up and including those those five points. Absolutely, Chair. If it's okay with you, may I go back to some of our slides? I think it'll help to have a visual on these. Please, yes. I want you to use whatever you need to to help answer. 
Thank you so much for doing so. Thank you. Um, so if I can get this to go back, I'll start with your first is, is restrictions within the ag buffer. The way the city code works is the agricultural buffer needs to be a minimum of 150 feet wide. The internal 50 feet is to be activated. It's to serve some sort of public recreational function uh, to allow people to go out in it, to be able to view the adjacent agricultural lands, um, but still be a distance from them, which is what then leads to the next 100 feet, which is the 100 feet that is not supposed to be activated, which keeps people away from ag. The concept there is you don't want to um, allow urbanization to become a nuisance to the adjacent agriculture and in any way prohibit their ability to continue to ag success, do agricultural operations successfully. Right, so the exterior 100 feet remains in somewhat of a native state. The interior, um, you utilize riparian vegetation or um, uh, native vegetation, drought tolerant. It feels somewhat natural, but it is activated. Um, our vision for this, and I can skip up a slide. The way this site drains is from, believe it or not, we have the Mace Drainage Canal on the north, but the site will drain from the north to the south. Um, we've ask the city for the right to utilize bioswales. So instead of putting all of our stormwater drainage into pipes and piping it offsite, we're gonna try to maximize groundwater recharge on site. What does not recharge will flow to the south and eventually loop to the east in ever increasing um, uh, drainage channels or conveyance systems until it gets all the way to the northeast corner where it then flows back into the Mace drainage channel and offsite. Sorry, Matt, can, can I just ask, could, could, you, could you use your, the cursor and just draw, I mean, put, put where, what were you talking about? Sure, so the, say starting at the north, uh -huh. all of this, as, as stormwater is collected, it flows to the south. And we actually mm -hmm. have, and it's hard to see on this exhibit, but there is a bike and walking path that actually loops the site. It's not just in the ag buffer, but it continues along the south and the west. It makes a full one and a half mile loop around the site. Okay. Um, the drainage flows to the south where it enters what is basically a landscape setback area, but it also serves to convey the drainage to the east, where it then comes into the outer 100 feet of the ag buffer, and so that the need to accommodate drainage increases as more and more drainage gets to this area. So by the time you get to the north, you have a pretty sizable drainage conveyance like what you see in this picture. Um, but say at the southern end of that ag buffer down here, I wish I might, I don't see it on there, but here you don't have much drainage at all. So what we've committed to is looking at a variety of native landscapes. We've talked about um, an oak savanna, as well as um, native grasslands where you could have uh, pictures. You can envision an environment similar to what's behind Chair Walsh, where you would have nesting opportunities and native trees, but also have grasslands to create foraging habitat. We've committed to putting burrowing owl uh, um, owl complex, a den complex in the southeast corner and really making that strong habitat values that are not riparian in nature. Now along the northern ag buffer, that will be riparian in nature. And what we've been working with is talking to the Center for Land-Based Learning has a sloughs program where they take you know, effectively old agricultural sloughs and try to convert them, getting rid of all the invasive species, bringing back native species. Um, and what we've looked at is with the Mace drainage channel, which effectively is like this, cutting a bench on the side that's on the nearest, the internal 50 feet, where you could then utilize that bench. It still serves its drainage purpose in the deep portion, but on the bench, we could plant riparian habitat and actually create some nice habitat value within that area. Um, so, so let me, yeah, I, 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 I apologize if I interrupt, but I just want there, there are some things that I'm not uh, getting here. The um, that cross section that you showed with the right over the riparian channel, where, yes. where could you just point out on your map where that cross section is? That cross section there would be, yeah, sure, no problem. That is here. That is roughly as deep as our drainage channel ever gets before it drains into the Mace drainage channel here. It dumps to the north. Okay. And then below, uh, south of your cursor, it wouldn't look like that? That's correct. So uh, the estimate was that the, the, the curvature to accommodate our drainage in most places is around two feet to three feet. 
And I think at a maximum depth that gets to six feet right before you dump into the maze drainage channel. So the picture you're seeing here is about the max depth that our exterior drainage uh, corridor ever would get. The depth, when you say depth, you mean depth from the surface down or? What you, Correct. Or, or from one end to the other? No, from the surface down. Okay. So you, you see that deepest section there would be basically yeah, yeah. Bang stormwater runoff, and then you would have the benches along the sides of it for more riparian style vegetation. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, I'm, it, it would be way more helpful, at least to me, if I could see these types of cross sections located at different parts on the north and the east uh, uh, ag buffer. Because from a, a tree planting perspective, uh, I have no idea uh, how, what, what are the opportunities to, uh, to, to, to plant trees. It seems like that, that, that cross section is only in the, uh, the, the northeast uh, part. And, and so I, I, you know, to me, yeah, have a, the, the tree planting opportunities are for, for, for the rest of the, the, the ag buffer. So I, I don't know how we could get around that. Uh, uh, but perhaps we, 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 we can't, but just to let you know. Well, I, I, do think, I do think one of the ways that we'll be able to address that is, is if the project is successful and we're coming back to you at a mapping stage and at a final PD stage, at that point, we will have that more detailed level of engineering for the entire site. And you will actually have those cross sections. And I think at that stage, you'll be reviewing landscaping plans. So I think, uh, I guess that's a long roundabout way of saying that's a level of detail that is not necessary for the, for the entitlements currently being sought, but that that level of detail will come back to this commission, I think, as we get forward with landscaping plans, which should be routed back to the tree commission. Okay, but you, and I'm not gonna argue with you, but uh, just, this is just for, for me as a commissioner, having to, to, to make a decision on this. Okay, just, yeah. just, 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 just FYI. Um, the one cross section, uh, that the, the, the artist drew, uh, I mean, that was able to be drawn, right? And it didn't need a final land landscaping plan. Uh, and you were saying what you envisioned the other areas to look like. So, so uh, I mean, and you don't have to answer this, but I'm not quite sure why, why that couldn't have been done for these other areas, just to give at least us on the tree commission and maybe the open space commission, perhaps just a, a better idea of, of, of what the trees are, are, are what, what the what the potential tree, tree planting uh, uh, area is. Um, so, so, so we've actually that's this conversation has covered a few of these these things. Uh, uh, could could you go to the um, could you go to the uh, the last one with the the artist's re rendering? Yes, and and as I'm going to that, I, I will say also. I do think it's important to keep in mind that, so that artist rendering was done by an architect, right? I, it wasn't done by, a, by a, anyone who was trying to reflect, you know, some sort of ultimate reality of what the site is. This is somebody who took an, an artistic rendition of what it could look like at build out. I mean, that's important to keep in mind as well. Um, you know, that, that cross section that was drawn was drawn by a landscape architect that works in an engineering firm. Um, and our last one is drawn by, by an architect um, on CAD, right? I mean, let's be honest. The trees that are shown here are not the trees we're going to end up planting. It doesn't even have the diversity. These are trees that are available within a program that they were able to place on site to give you a conceptual idea of what plantings could look like and how many trees could be accommodated. But this is supposed to be schematic. It's supposed to be conceptual at this point because we're not beyond the conceptual. Um, that's not the, the level well, of interest we're at. Yeah, well, let me just uh, let me just piggyback. I just want to, if for just one second, let's for, let's uh, stay with questioning too. Okay, 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 okay. So I guess my question was for was sure. basically how realistic? Uh, how is is this is this picture realistic or is it just is somebody's uh, a, 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 a attempt to sort of. Uh, you know, he, 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 he make it look like something that it may not look like, I guess is the question. Um, I, this is, given where we are in the process, this is a very time consuming and well thought out artist rendition. Um, but I, 
I, you know, will the ultimate build out look like this? And no, I think there will be a lot more planning that goes into this site and a lot more detail and a lot more discussion um, with various departments as we get further down the road. Okay. I would expect different variety. Right. Yeah, different yeah I, don't, I don't want to take up a lot of time. So th th thank you. I, I, I do understand what you're saying. Uh, and Colin's right, it's just a matter of, of my opinion. Um, uh, let me ask you just, one, uh, well, two, two more quick things, okay, if I could. Uh, would you guys be open to uh, having your final landscape plan that I'm understanding that tree positioning and all that kind of stuff, what it's gonna look like uh, once the project gets built for real, uh, would, you, would, you, would you guys be, uh, what would your feeling be in terms of uh, letting others re review that, including uh, now, I, I know your your arborist, you brought him him or her in, uh, but arborists, landscape designers, and, and urban foresters, uh, and a group like Tree Davis, uh, you know, they they all have a, a different view of the world uh, and what that world should should look like, and I'm wondering if you guys would be willing to entertain uh, bringing in a few of these people or at least sending your plans out for a wide range of a wider range of of, of people uh, to, uh, to 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 look at regarding the uh, the, the planting design for for trees I'll give you a short answer absolutely um, we've already met with tree Davis now multiple times um, we want to continue to foster that relationship um, if anybody knows the trees of Davis, they do, um, right? And and not to mention, it all comes back to the city. So our, maybe our people in consultation with various experts come up with original concept, but then it comes through and gets vetted by both your commission, planning commission, staff. Um, there will be a robust review and commenting on whatever plans eventually come forward. Okay, so you guys would be, um, I, I guess what I'm asking to be very specific is, is in your development plan, as you're designing the final landscape plan, would you be willing before it goes to the city council to include some of these people, like I'm saying, urban foresters, uh, urban advocacy groups, well, a, a, tree, a group like Tree Davis, landscape designers and arborists, would you, be, would you be willing to include a wider range of people in your planning process before yes. it actually comes back to us? Yes. Okay, okay. Just uh, one last thing. Uh, you might not know the answer. Uh, for the, the solar, is the, uh, do you know how much of the, uh, the energy footprint that's needed for this site is going to be provided by your, your current vision of what solar is going to be? We're attempting to be able to generate all the energy demand on site. That is the goal of the project. Um, that is all predicated on a belief that we understand what the energy demands of our users are going to be. So there could be a scenario in which we get a couple of users that have a very high energy demand. In that mm -hmm. scenario, we will probably be a lower percentage. Um, but we've also made a commitment to utilize a 100% sustainable energy provider, such as Valley Clean Energy's Ultra Green program. So if we're not generating it all on site, we'll be buying it from a local sustainable purveyor of energy. Do you have any, and just one quick follow-up question to that, sorry, I'm taking time. Um, do, you ever, do you ever envision the needs, the energy needs for the project uh, being such that you might be able to eliminate some of the, the, the parking lot solar? I would love to think that energy generation technology is going to improve to a point that we could eventually get rid of a lot of this solar. Um, during the lifetime of this project, I hope that that innovation comes along. Um, but I also know that there's a lot of technology that has increasing energy demands. And so we're trying to be careful. We've had a lot of people talking to us about 3D printers, right? I mean, those are huge energy draws. Um, moving all of our drivers to electric vehicles that want to plug in at our site. So we're really trying to, to, to make sure that we are we have the ability to produce as much as possible on site with clearly the objective to be I mean, the PV is an eyesore, right? So we would love to get rid of it in the long run too. We'd prefer to have trees if we could. Okay. Okay. Th 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 thanks, Matt. Appreciate it.
Thank you, John. Thank you, Matt. Um, so next up, uh, David Robinson, do you have any clarifying questions? Uh, I'm the, the presentation has been excellent, very helpful. The comments which sneaked in instead of the clarifying questions have also been very helpful and I have no further clarifying questions myself. Great. Thank you, David. Um, I have a few clarifying questions. Um, so, uh, and, I'm, and I'm the last uh, in the row and after me, we'll see if there's any go backs and then we can take public comment. Um, so uh, one thing I, that stuck out to me uh, reading the, um, the narrative about the project was it, it, it seemed to emphasize more that there was design variability that you know, sort of what's being presented in the pictures and in, in the graphics uh, could very well change. It, and I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if I just don't remember or if, I, if, it's, if it's more variable than the previous project in what you might uh, do. No, the answer is it is, uh, the variability has not been modified. Um, okay. Cool. You're, you're seeing, uh, I mean, your roadways are going to be where they're going to be, your parks are going to be where they're going to be, the ag buffer is going to be where the ag buffer is going to be, the square footages and units are what they are. What is potentially could change is, say, the footprint of a structure. If you had a user come in and they had a need for a building like Apple wants to build a circle building out here, we're going to let them build a circle building, um, <laughs> right? So that can change. And that then changes where and how you plant your trees. Cool. Uh, so the you spoke to the timing and said that this was a 10 to 15 year build out. And um, uh, just kind of as a, a note with that, you know, one thing I noted is that the phasing of the path on the on the north side has moved up and that the trees will get planted earlier in the new project. Um, and the, with the timing of 10 to 15 years, I just wanted to help me if you could help me remember what the t the timing was was the build out 20 years for the previous project that's correct the the build out for the eir was an assumption of 20 years which um we thought was the most aggressive build out you would possibly see and then we talked publicly we said 20 to 25. so in this version we're saying 10 to 15 which again 10 is what i believe they're utilizing for purposes of the analysis which would be the most aggressive bringing all the impacts to the front Okay. But with the recognition, recognition also that ec economies and demand fluctuates, right? So you could have halfway through the build out a slowdown and then it comes back up again. So am I right in kind of guesstimating that the trees on the north side of the project uh, in along the bike path in the ag buffer, like they might be planted 10 to 15 years earlier than in the old version? Kind of guesstimate time. I'm trying to think about this real quick. Um, in the northern ag buffer, which was previously the center of the project. Well, yeah. yeah, they would be fast forwarded because, well, first of all, now we envision a phase 1A is likely in that northwest corner. Um, so that area is likely to be planted early and first. So it would be considerably before they would have been planted in the prior version of the project. That's great. Um, I'm wondering uh, about the parks and uh, how the um, what so none of the pictures you showed of the park hat showed the lit softball field and I'm wondering like when you say a lit softball field is it going to have a lot of hardscape and bleachers hardscaped in and like how much that's going to affect trees and shading in the park. And, or if sure. you're even ready to say, to talk to that at this point. I mean, I can tell you what we've talked about conceptually with the, with the straight answer being that park planning is a subsequent phase and we're committed to bringing it back to the parks commission as well to the city. Um, so what we're showing is a potential layout for a park design, which is gonna be subject to future entitlements and have to go through city approval. But we're showing the softball field in the Southeast corner. Um, it would be a lit field. Um, and obviously you can't have trees within the field or within the outfield. I think those would be your only limitations. They are showing dugouts in this. We probably envision some 
small bleacher seats as well. Um, but all of that is, is subject to subsequent entitlements. Um, we just had recreation and park last night and they were very clear that the actual design of the park will come back to the city in a subsequent process. They were also right. very clear though, that they want a lit ball field. And a lit ball field was a firm commitment from the developer and continues to be one. Um, we heard strongly from the softball community in Davis that there was a big need for girls softball fields that they felt that they were underserved and didn't have a lit field anywhere. Um, and we made that commitment and we're sticking to it. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, the facilities for women's sports uh, have not always gotten the, the best attention, but that's, that's a bit of an aside. Uh, okay, so this is probably the big one. Uh, so in the uh, document, the attachment five, the tree commission comparison chart, the tree where we, we talk about tree commission uh, recommendation one, and then there's a DISC 2022 uh, response. Um, so, and this, this gets to the number of trees, right? So it says the developer in consultation with the, the landscape architect has determined that the site will likely accommodate 600 to 1,200 trees. However, after consulting with Tree Davis, rather than committing to a specific and arbitrary number, DISC 2022 will instead focus on planting the right trees in correct conditions to achieve the desired shade coverage and canopy performance. Uh, developer remains committed to monitoring by a third party arborist. Uh, so I've had good conversations with uh, Greg McPherson as well. Uh, and we did before the previous uh, disc uh, recommendations as well. And he was definitely pointing towards uh, canopy coverage percentages as a metric. So I'm wondering, uh, so the question is what, if we're not gonna use a number of trees as the metric for how many trees are gonna go in the project, mm -hmm. uh, what metric are you proposing to use for, can for uh, trees in the project that could be a baseline feature? Um, what we've currently proposed, and thanks for the question. I think that was a good question. Um, and, and I know you remember last time, there was a lot of back and forth about how many trees were the right number and what, what the fit was. Um, what, what we had talked about was, um, and this I think came from the Tree Commission last time, 80% coverage, shade coverage, canopy coverage of uh, bike paths, walking paths. Um, so that would be street, um, sidewalk adjacent trees, street adjacent trees to shade sidewalks, as well as in, within the 50, foot internal ag buffer so that we're shading the class one bike trail as well as a walking pass there. We also have walking pass around the southern and west east western perimeter of the site. So it would need to fully shade all of those. So we're talking 80% shade coverage for pedestrian walking and biking, 50% uh, for parking lots. And Greg also suggested that he had seen that 50% was a good shading um, objective to hit for the trees, our internal streets within the project site as well. Um, which seemed reasonable to us. Um, I will say that we've, our, our, we haven't really leaned into that subject yet with city staff, um, but if you have recommendations at the tree commission, I feel like that would be totally appropriate for you to make to the council. Okay, that's great. So, uh, so when you spoke just now, you said shade coverage and looking at the same document uh, where the tree commission previously recommended 80% canopy coverage, um, your, the language you have is, uh, as the response is landscaping shall provide 80% shading of pedestrian walkways and off street class one bike paths that are not otherwise shaded by photovoltaics or other renewable energy generation. Mm -hmm. So, it doesn't, it doesn't actually say that it'll be tree shade. It could be tree shade, but it, it might not be. Am I reading that accurately? I believe you're reading that accurately. And the same language is true for the uh, parking lots as well, right? That's the, correct. The, uh, so are you familiar with uh, 
the Davis Municipal Code 37.02.020, street trees and street trees associated with building permits. I think that's the right one. I, I guess what I'm trying to get to is, are you familiar with the, the um, that 50% shade coverage of the streets is actually within municipal code? Yeah, well, we, we couldn't actually shade our, our streets with photovoltaic. Um, at least I've never seen that before. So any shading that would take place on a street, I think would be from trees. Okay. I don't think there's any other way we could do it, but I'm, I mean, the designers surprise me all the time, but I believe that <laughs> tree shading will be, uh, <laughs> streets will be shaded by trees. Right, maybe it'll be a, an entire dome over the whole project of photovoltaic, right? <laughs> I'm thinking they're the probably dome. gonna get smaller, I hope, but we'll, yeah. we'll have to see. Uh, so in the previous tree commission recommendations, uh, tree commission recommendation four, and this is still on the same theme of percentages of canopy coverage. Yes. Uh, we recommended 15% um, canopy coverage for manufacturing areas. And so this is immediately following the parking lot one, which is immediately following the um, bike path one. You responded that you're, you have the same response previously identified, project will comply with city standards. Uh, what are the city standards that you'll comply with for shading in the manufacturing area? Um, I believe it would pertain to parking lot shading. Um, and whatever landscape standards would apply through our adopted landscape plan once that's in place prior to us constructing any of those buildings. So is there a percentage of canopy coverage for manufacturing areas? Um, that might be better for, for Rob or Sherry. Yeah, if, Sherry, if you can help too, please. Our shading requirements are designed for parking lots. So outside of the parking lot, I'm not entirely sure I understand what you would be shading. I mean, other than the parking area, you have structure and then you have landscape setbacks areas. Um, our manufacturing structures are, I think are 45 feet tall. Um, so you're not really gonna be shading that structure much. It would just be what landscaping is around the structure itself. Um, and what, what I guess, I don't know that you have a shading requirement within a landscape setback area that would all come in through the adopted landscape plan that would go back through the city process. When you get to the point, and this would be far down the road from where we are today, somebody comes in and they want to build a particular building, it would be subject to design review. And part of that design review process includes the landscaping plans. And those are reviewed and approved by the planning commission most of the time. Sometimes it's city council, but many times okay. it's planning commission. Good, uh, thank you so much for your answer. So the, um, so there would be zero, there'd be zero requirement for canopy coverage in the manufacturing area. Yeah, it doesn't fall under the nature of canopy coverage. It does fall under the nature of, of providing open space and landscaping in and around a project site. And there would be in the manufacturing areas a requirement for canopy within the parking area. In the parking lot, yes. And but within the rest the, of it is... service those areas. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. So then uh, in the parks, is there a city, so you have a sort of the same thing, see above, we recommended 30% uh, in the parks, in part based on the illustrations we'd seen, I think, in the previous subcommittee. Um, and you say same, uh, see above, is there a, any particular canopy coverage amount that would be in the parks? I don't think that there is. I think that those designs and the parks programming that's done through the Parks and Rec and Parks Commission is how they determine how many trees they want to have in the parks. Rob may know better than me, but I am unaware of any standard that they have for how many trees have to go into a park. Right. Um, so are there any other areas of the project, like, I don't know, hotel or commercial or other parts where there's a, a specific canopy coverage amount that the developer is planning on committing to? Well, I think we can state pretty clearly that the, 
the canopy coverage or the shade coverage that would be provided in all of these areas at a minimum is 50% in the parking areas, which is associated with all of them. In the landscaped areas, you typically hit a higher number than that based upon landscape plans that are approved by the city. Um, I mean, I think it's in the interest of both the developer as well as the property owner to, to shade your green areas better than you're shading your parking lots. Um, so while there is no set standard, as Sherry mentioned, this is usually addressed at a, at a project specific design review as you're coming through the entitlement process. Um, I, I personally think that almost all of your parks probably achieve greater than a 30% canopy. Um, I, I mean, that's, I see Commissioner Gunther shaking his head, maybe it's lower than that. Davis has some fantastic trees. It feels like it's more than 30%, but. It, it depends on parks. I mean, if it's uh, Playfields Park, it's mostly baseball fields. It's, there's not a lot of coverage. If it's, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of a really good one. Oh, if it's the park in College Park, it's really high. Uh, right. But it's a, it's a, you know, a tiny little park that's mostly about shade trees, so. Anyway, which the, which so why what I'm looking really for off to the actual planning process for those parks, right? Because they want to provide that flexibility to decide what the priority of the community is at the time, whether it's sports fields or right. Reading. So what the what I'm looking for, and this is the final question about the canopy stuff, is uh, what metric for trees are you proposing as a baseline feature? Um, we would be proposing 80% coverage in pedestrian paths, walkways, and bike trails, achieving 50% through a mix of trees and PV within the parking areas, 50% of the roadways, and any remaining percentage to be determined based upon approved landscape plans as we come through the process, and based upon actual structure design and the layout of the, each individual site. Um, I, I don't know that I've ever seen a master planned community when you're at a, a zoning level that indicates a blanketed percentage that would apply uniformly across a site. I don't, I'm not even sure that you can do that. Yep, I think that's a very fair answer. Um, thank, thank you so much for going down that path. I have a couple other questions. Um, uh, oh, this is probably a, a, a relatively easy one. Um, so previously we were concerned about trees being planted uh, in burrowing owl areas. Um, is there, has there been a new burrowing owl survey or will there be a new, uh, uh, any new biological survey for the area? Uh, yes, the biological assessment was updated uh, within the last three months. And were there any burrowing owls in the area? Um, that will require the release of the environmental document, but to our knowledge, this portion of the property actually never had burrowing owls on it um, and still does not. Um, nevertheless, we have committed to creating the, the burrowing owl den complex in the ag buffer. Uh, Open Space and Habitat Commission believes the appropriate location is the southeast corner of the ag buffer but our final location and design is to be um, determined in consultation with a biologist that specializes in the owl to be vetted by the city and signed off on by the city before it's constructed. Right. My concern there is we don't want to recommend trees in the wrong place, right? That's the, my only reason for asking. Well, uh, and that, that, that actually is part of our challenge here too, of yeah. getting down to the brass tacks of what goes where is there's a lot of variables that are going to factor into this when we actually get to specific site construction. Great. Um, so you talked a little bit about uh, existing tree location. Uh, I, rem I think in some of the original documents, you noted there, it was noted that there were um, some native trees. Was it uh, cottonwoods? Black willows, cottonwoods, and black uh, cotton Fremont cottonwoods and Godding's black willows, are those? And it, but I wasn't clear if it was the ones outside of the boundary or the ones inside the boundary. And I'm just wondering what the plan is with the, the those native trees that have been noted before. Oh, 
Oh, Matt, you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, to the ones on site, you can actually see the satellite image is pretty clear. There's, I think, four trees. Uh, three of the four are within the riparian corridor. Uh, so to the extent that we can preserve those, that would be our objective. Um, they're there and they're in the right location. So that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I believe there's only one tree that likely needs to be removed and replaced and we'll follow tree mitigation standards before doing that. Um, and my understanding is before that tree could ever be removed it needs to come to you all as well. Okay, that's great. And do you know if that's one of the native ones, the cottonwoods or the willow? Um, you know, I, I actually don't know. Um, I, I, I don't I, expect it. It's a, it's a tiny detail. That, I think that all the ones that are on our site are cottonwoods. I don't think we have anything actually on the project site other than cottonwoods. Okay, cool. Um, the uh, parking lot requirement. Um, I think I remember reading in uh, among the documents uh, statements about the, the city law about uh, parking lots, say, stating that solar or trees are allowable in parking lots. And maybe this is a question for Sherry. Um, my reading of the parking lot ordinance is extremely specific that it requires trees. 50% um, of paved parking lot shall be with, uh, shall be with tree canopies within 15 years of securing building permit development of such canopy shall be in accordance with master parking lot tree list guidelines. Is there some other place in city code that allows for solar panels in parking lots? There have been structures allowed in parking lots in Davis all over the city, garages, carports, solar carports, and all of those things preclude the installation of trees. So your whatever so we have someone who proposes a structure, those areas are no longer required to be shaded by trees. Okay. And I do believe that is an area that some specificity is gonna come out of the two by two or is supposed to come out of the two by two process that the council set up a couple of months ago. Awesome. I'm almost through my questions and thank you so much for your patience. And I particularly appreciate you going through all of the canopy percent canopy stuff with me. Um, the, I have, I, I went and I was looking at the ag buffer ordinance. Um, and you had suggested that there might be allowed to be solar in the outer 100 feet. Is that, is, is that allowable as a utility corridor? Is that the use that would that you're saying might allow solar out there? You know, I apologize. I don't have that section of your ordinance open up at the moment. I know that when we initially proposed this project and we're in early discussions with the city back in 2016 about what uses the city would entertain, uh, solar was on the table. Um, however, we have not pursued that. Uh, we did not pursue that in the last round. Um, and I think it's highly unlikely that solar would go in the exterior 100 foot of the ag buffer at this point, given other commitments that we've made. Um, so that's a long way of saying, I'm not sure. I would have to look at the ordinance to see if it's permitted. But at this point, I don't believe that we're proposing that anyway. Okay, um, that's all of my questions. Thank you so much for your patience with me for to go through all of that. Um, I, I guess at this point, uh, are there other clarifying questions from commissioners before we take public comment. I'm looking for hands at this point. Okay, I see uh, both uh, Tracy and Larry have uh, raised their hands. Let's take that in that order, Tracy, then Larry. Um, thank you very much. So I do have a few questions. I'll just hammer through them real quick. Um, to, for clarity, are trees discouraged from being planted in the ag buffer? Absolutely not. That's probably the best place for trees. Um, we even are required to plant um, trees to a level of hedgerows when we're adjacent to our residential structures. Um, and so I think one of the earlier comments was about plantings that were done nicely that resulted in a look of a natural hedgerow. Um, so we will have not just tree plantings, but at some locations, rather dense tree plantings in the ag buffer. Okay, thank you. Define turf and where it would go. 
Sure, turf is um, typically grass, like the grass you see in your front yard that makes up a football field or a baseball field. Um, we have committed to not utilizing turf to the extent we don't have to because it is very, it has a high water demand. Are you talking um, about the synthetic or are you talking about just grass like lawns? Grass like lawns. The other is artificial turf typically. So I'm talking about grass. Okay. Um, okay, that's really the clarity I was looking for. Um, and then you also spoke of um, renewable energy outside of solar. Um, can you elaborate on what you meant by that? Renewable and energy generations. Um, I can find the exact quote. Um, but, you know, it's, I'll, get, I'll get back to it. Instead, um, we at one I, point had, we at one point had had looked at the ability to create energy on site in other ways. I mean, part of what this is is a tech center, so we could have users that are able to utilize their manufacturing processes to actually, while they're in the process of um, creating certain things, also create power as a side as a byproduct. Um, perhaps utilizing waste to generate power, and what we're seeking is entitlements that would allow us to pursue those technologies. If we had a user that was particularly interested in that, we wanted the city to recognize that as something that we're allowed to do under the zoning at the site. Okay, I see. So I found the bullet point where it does state the project site will provide a healthy tree canopy to achieve the following shade coverage. And, you know, it st states the 80% of the pedestrian walkways and the off street class one bike paths. Um, and then it, it, it says, you know, the 50% shading for the internal streets, but then it says trees shall be used to achieve 50% shading of off-grade parking, not otherwise shaded by PV or other renewable energy generation. I was just wondering what was meant by that renewable energy generation, if there was something specific that was being considered outside of PV. Um, no. The simple answer is uh, not to my knowledge. I don't, I don't know any other technology that is feasible at this site. Um, but again, given the duration of the existence of this site, once it is constructed, you know, we hope we're going to have a thriving center for a good 75 years here. Um, we want to leave open the option that um, as technology comes along, that it's able to be utilized. So that was just to build in that opportunity that we didn't want to limit ourselves to just PV if something better comes along in the future. I see, I see. I guess I, I just wanted to be aware of the attentions behind the statement because um, this would be at the expense of trees from what I can understand. And then um, another bullet point, um, it states uh, attachment of shading requirements shall be demonstrated within uh, 15 years of planting. Failure to meet shading requirements shall be considered a code violation and subject to penalty unless said failure was the result of an act of God or unforeseeable event, which is no fault to developer. Any violation shall be remedied through additional plantings of PV. Yeah, that is clearly a typo. Uh, I, you don't plant PV. Um, so I think it was supposed to say additional plantings or PV. That should have been an or and not an of. That's what they call a solar farm, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so then that is, I'm glad that that's clarified. Um, are you willing, is this developer willing to commit to a specific number of trees? Uh, again, I think our objective at this point is focusing on canopy, but if you all would like to recommend a specific number of trees, um, you know, we would take it into consideration. Well, I just consider um, that a specific number of trees, um, I think it will allow us to reinforce um, and, and allow for success for everyone, for all who, who, you know, all benefit from trees. So there's a real inherent, you know, reason behind this. Well, and I will say that our, our Again, our, our expert that looked at the site conservatively said on a conservative end, it could accommodate 600 trees and on an aggressive end, 1,200. 
So I mean, so I would that, you be willing to commit to twelve hundred at least in the baseline feature? Well, no, because that was the aggressive end, and that would be that was his assumption that we had no PV in the parking lots, right? So that it was a range based upon the amount of PV versus not having PV and the amount of area that was going to be constrained by the drainage can channel or not. So he, yeah. he's putting a, a, a range. So again, that was part of why we said we don't want to commit to an arbitrary number because then five years down the road, you're getting to the point where you're building buildings and you realize like, oh shoot, we're going to have 1150 trees, but we committed to 1200. And then suddenly we're planting maybe not the best species in the right locations to comply with an arbitrary number that we all agreed to. And, you know, that's not to really anyone's benefit. That's not to the benefit of the community or the benefit of the trees themselves. So we'd rather focus on the right trees, the right locations, achieving canopy and achieving good tree health. Um, would you guys be willing? Happens, though, currently there's four trees or five trees on site. If we even ended up in the worst case scenario, it's 600. That's a benefit of 595 new trees to the urban canopy within the city of Davis. Yes, yes, very, very good. Um, considering um, this co inherent conflict that seems to be sort of a rumor, I think anyways, and I have to say I am on that uh, subcommittee. So it has been of, of discussion and on my mind for several months. Um, and so would your team be willing to, um, you know, hold off on or to, you know, just wait to see what this, um, this two by two recommends and because it may not be this conflict between trees and solar and it may be that in fact, they can, you know, coexist very well. Um, would you consider that? You're on mute. Apologize. Thank you. Is that you can hear me now? Yes. I will say that. Well, one, we followed what's going on in the city and have, have you know, monitored what happened at at Sutter. Um, been watching the conversation unfold, and we know that the city is working towards finding out what its new solution is going to be. Um, I think, as you see here in some of these pictures that we were able to find, we are looking at what is what is a way that you can still get generation of, of on-site renewable energy and still have trees and the two can coexist and coexist well. Um, we want that solution. Um, and if you all find a solution that works, uh, we would be happy to embrace it. Yeah, um, only because yeah. I see that and I mean, this is more of maybe discussion, but I'm, I'm not sure how to go about this, but um, yeah, so in any case, I, I did have one more uh, clarifying question and I was wondering, um, it's in regards to enforcement, um, which seems to be getting harder and harder, especially without um, not with, without knowing what we're enforcing. Um, right. But I was will, will, wondering if you guys would be willing to, you know, pay for the, the for the city to hire the arborist to review the plans every year for the first five years and then every other year in perpetuity for the health of the trees. Am I off mute? Um, so I actually believe we already committed to that. I believe it's in the DA that not only do we have to plant the trees and plant the trees in the right way, that the planting has to be monitored by an arborist and that we have to be monitored annually or biannually. It may have been biannually in the DA um, by a certified arborist that comes to the site at our expense to ensure that the trees are still growing, that they're still alive, that they're growing at the right pace and that they're going to achieve the shading standards um, and they continue to monitor. And if it even says specifically in the DA that if they decide that that tree is not achieving its growth rates as necessary or has died, it will be replaced um, at our expense and again monitored by a certified arborist approved by the city when we do it. So yeah, we're willing to commit to it. We already did and we're sticking to that commitment. We're happy to do so. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna follow up just really quick, Larry just because it's it's just right on that and that's so where 
it talks about incurred extra costs in the attachment five. The, um, the answer from the developer does not, doesn't say that it's willing to pay the extra costs. Is that maybe a mistake? Is it intended to be in there? Which number? TC, TC what? TC20. TC20. Extra costs incurred when developer can we allow improper plantings and have not signed off on or have any of the following the proper tree planted, the proper sod. So which number said proper tech? Sorry, I'm looking at CT20 and I don't see what's the cost? Where where's that? Um extra costs incurred when the developer, contractor, et cetera, allow for improper plantings that have not been signed off. Etc. Hmm. The longer uh, answer is at TC sixteen too. I I'm not sure how it plays into that one. So, if I recall, TC twenty was actually that we should have a planting plan, a comprehensive planting plan that was approved by the city. That we should identify every tree, its location, its age and have a map that is associated with it that an arborist came out and tracked them all by number and tag, I think through the process. Um, and so I think that TC20 was associated with that. Um, where we ended up in the DA was that we had an obligation to plant trees under the review of an arborist. And so <laughs> there was a situation in which we had a improper planting because we can't have any planting without it being reviewed. Um, and there's, I don't know what the extra cost would be for removing it, but all costs associated with removing and replanting trees are the responsibility of the developer. And I see the arborist to come out and, and monitor us and check us. So we're also paying for that arborist to come out and, and penalize us. And I, 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 this is for Tracy as much as anything. I see in 16, it says that inspection, maintenance, and replacement costs shall be borne by the developer services district. So it's exactly what Matt's saying, I think. So. Uh, thank you. Larry? Yeah, thanks. I should have said this at the beginning of this conversation as we are this agenda item. It's not a question, Matt, take a breath. Um, so I am a board member of Tree Davis. I need to put that out there. Um, Tree Davis has no official or legal relationship with the developers and the um, the board, uh, the developers have not come to the board um, to have a discussion and I have not had any discussion individually as an individual or as a member of Tree Davis, the end. Thanks, Larry. So I think we're getting close to wrapping up uh, clarifying questions. Uh, I see John has his hand up. Do you have another clarifying question, John? If I could just ask one that relates to what uh, what Tracy was saying, um, <clears throat> uh, the it, re, it relates to the to, to the third party uh, arborist. Um, is uh, the developer willing to provide money to the city, and the city would hire the arborist, and the arborist would be responsible to have to report to the city? If I can have a minute, um, and maybe I could come back to that, but my recollection, and I'm gonna say this is just recollection and I would like to confirm, but was that the arborist is a third party agreed upon by both the city and the developer, and that the arborist report is provided to the urban forest manager of the city. So in that sense, it's a mutually agreed upon neutral third party that meets all of the requirements and they do report to the city. Right. Well, I guess uh, I guess then uh, let me let me add a question to that. Who 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 tells the city? Who tells the third party arborist ye, what, what 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 to do? So, in other words, in in in, in common parlance, you know, who who signs the check? Who is this arborist responsible to? You or the city? I would say that the arborist is responsible to the city because it's the commitments that are made upon in the DA that the, that the arborist is taking its action based upon the commitments in the DA. 
and it's the city's job to ensure enforcement of the DA. So I would think in that logical framework, the city would, to ensure that we comply with the DA, would need to make sure that we had an arborist that was doing the things and the city would provide that arborist with a list of the, a copy of the DA with those provisions pertinent to what that person is supposed to do on our site. And then their report would be based upon what the DA commitments tell them they're supposed to do on site. And they would provide a report to the city showing how we were or were not in compliance with the DA. And if the and if it has to be changed, if their monitoring schedule or design has to be changed, uh, that would be um, that would be prerogative of the city. Uh, but if their monitoring schedule or you know, or, in other words, or design, and the developers say, well, we 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 you know we don't think you should do this anymore, or you know, I mean. Uh, uh, you know, in other words, I mean, uh, you know, put quite, quite uh, bluntly, uh, is the arborist going to have any responsibility uh, to to you guys in terms of being told what 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 to do and 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 uh, and how to to do it? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, so there's an annual review of the DA that's intended to occur for any project that has a DA, there's an annual review where a staff person comes back to the council and says, here are those aspects of the DA that are currently done. Here is how the developer has complied or is complying. And hypothetically, it would be during that annual update that you would also see the report from the arborist and that that would be evidence of our compliance with the DA, right? So if we just decided one day to say, hey, Arborist, we don't want to pay you anymore. Don't come out here. Then the annual review of our DA, which is presented to the council in a public forum, should reflect that. At which point, I would assume that somebody would say, "What the heck's going on? You don't have authorization to just tell this guy not to come out anymore." Okay. So, so just one last quick thing on that. If the um, and and I I know you know where I'm going with this. Uh, um, so when there is when the management plan and the monitoring plan get established. Do you see those being established along with the landscape plan? And, uh, you know, and what role, what role will a developer play in developing um, uh, the monitoring and, 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 and maintenance plan? Is that going to be a, a negotiation between you and the, the city? Or, or how does that get established? What that plan will be? Sure, so the landscape plan itself will be approved by the city. So how the site gets landscaped and planted will be subject to right. design review and approval by the city. Um, so that right. will be designed by us, approved by and reviewed and approved by you all. Um, the way we envision it at the site is we are actually forming a master owners association. So the commercial owners actually form an association that similar to an HOA is responsible for the ongoing maintenance and care of all the common areas, which would include all of the landscape areas. So that master owners association will have a full-time staff member that is in charge of ensuring that the master owners association is doing all of the things that it's being paid to do and that it's contractually obligated to do. It will be that MOA that is tracking our maintenance, making sure we're fulfilling obligations and most likely the one that's interfacing with the um, arborist as they come out to the site. Okay, so you'll work, um, and this is the last thing. So you'll, when, uh, so it sounds like the maintenance and the monitoring plan will be part of the landscaping plan. And if that's correct, that will be all negotiated with the, with, with the city at the appropriate time. I think that's a safe, safe summary of, yes. That sounds appropriate. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. So I'm, I'm seeing Sherry raising her hand. Sherry, it's uh, easier for me to see if you use the Zoom raise hand, but I see you and uh, I, I know you wanna say something. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say all of this that you've just been discussing is covered in uh, comment number 16. Yep. And it was in there before. Yep. So we've, we've had this in there since last year. And yes. basically what it amounts to is the, the arborist, or if it's not Rob, if it's a consultant arborist, they work for the city and are paid for by the developer. 
It also goes on to say compliance with Arborist recommendations is mandatory. So they don't have a choice. And I think we're subject to penalty if we don't comply. That's right. Yep. Thank you so much for the clarification. Um, so Jim, I had seen your hand earlier. It looked like you took it down. I see you shaking your head. Um, I took it down. And I don't see any other hands raised. Uh, I have, I personally have one last question, which is um, we've talked about the parking lot uh, canopy coverage. It's a very intriguing thing that Sherry said is that it, that the, the solar panels are not, are allowable because they're a structure. So that strikes me as then, well, then the rest of the parking lot should be covered by 50% canopy coverage, right? If it's because you cover the part of the canopy, you cover the part of the parking lot that's not covered by the structure with the 50% canopy coverage. So it's, it's actually really enlightening and it's made me think about it a very different way. But if we were talking about just shade coverage for the parking lot, um, it strikes me that a higher percentage number for the total, because solar panels have a, you know, a very compact and complete shade coverage compared to tree plantings. So like if it was a, say 60% total shade coverage of photovoltaics and trees is, uh, or 70% even of photovoltaics and trees, is that in the realm of possibilities of what the developer might consider, Matt? I'll be honest, I am probably not the right person to answer that. We would want to consult with our engineers, um, as well as somebody who knows photovoltaics um, and solar arrays better than I do. I apologize. Okay. Um, so I think we're, we're really close. I see Tracy's raised her hand, though. Um, so... If anyone else has has a has a clarifying question, I think we're we very well clarified things. But uh, Tracy, do you want to you want to ask one uh, uh, some more? Yeah, questions? just just yeah. real quick. And this may I'm not sure how this is going. Maybe this will come up later. But I was just wondering, um, you know, Sherry, if we're going to be going through and making edits to each one of these things. So if I wanted to like um, make a proposal for a change in one of them, like that TC sixteen. Um, I was just looking to maybe add um, that some of those audits or that those audits come to the tree commission just for a checks and balances um, approach. I don't know if that's something that can be included or if that's something we need to discuss or what, but that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. I, I think that's where we're going to, I think we're going to get to working on that right after public comment. And I suspect we're ready for public comment now. Um, so if there's uh, anyone who would like to make a public comment, uh, if you're on a phone, please press nine. If you're on Zoom, please press uh, the raise your hand button. We have one public commenter. Matt, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and share your comment. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I'm not going to belabor this, but one of, and you've received a written version of this comment, but um, I too was very concerned that the uh, um, repeated designation of the third party verification by the city's urban forest manager in the documents. I think it's essential that there be an arm's length relationship in the, the whole situation. Uh, if only for optics, be uh, be nonpartisan and an arm's length. So, um, a third party independent expert such as Tree Davis um, would be uh, would would seem like it makes sense. With that said, I'm very concerned that the DISC 2022 tree commitments and the Tree Commission comments do not incorporate the recently learned lessons from the Sutter Davis tree controversy. Specifically, the DISC documents and, and commitments set up an either or conflict between trees and volt photovoltaic arrays. That conflict could be avoided and wherever possible, either or should be replaced by both end. The best way to accomplish that is to wherever possible, maximize the amount of photovoltaic array placement in locations on the site that would not otherwise 
be locations for trees. If 100% of the rooftop area of all buildings is covered by photovoltaic arrays, the need for an either or choice between photovoltaic arrays and trees, such as we had in the Sutter Davis situation, would be all but eliminated. Further, if any new disk or part thereof is connected to a microgrid, it would certainly make economic sense to maximize rooftop uh, area usage for photovoltaics. Generally, restricting the size of rooftop arrays makes no sense in a microgrid context because undersized arrays result in higher production costs. Now, Larry said early on that he was concerned that one of the comments that you received in writing uh, strayed away from trees. And if that were, had to do with my comment, please accept my apology. But I really do think that the either or uh, conflict between trees and photovoltaics is something that we should learn from the lessons that we had at Sutter Davis. And it absolutely is both a tree commission and a natural resources commission uh, issue. And as a result, I have, and in, with regard to that, I have copied the and Natural Resources Commission on my written comment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Um, and we have uh, another commenter. Um, we'll go to Alan Hirsch next, if you could just give me one moment. Okay, Alan, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Alan, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and share your comment. Hi, can I have a few more than three minutes? I've waited here for an hour and a half. I have some material and I've been through this process a while. Could I have that, ask that courtesy of the chair? Equal time, the, 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 the presenter has been on and asked questions for almost an hour and a half. Equity would say that I should have this, I should have a little bit more than three minutes. Uh, d does the uh, commission that's a chair, that's a chair and a commission to my best staff liaison commission decision equity yeah so will uh, is four minutes enough for you Alan I'll try to keep it keep it into four okay thank you so much for your indulgence I appreciate that um, Thank you. Matt, 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 I'm asking because Matt referred to me particularly, and I want to appreciate Matt. And I work with him. And we need this project. This is an important project for the city. And I want to be able to endorse this thing. And I endorsed the last project. But it has changed, and things have changed and been revealed in the time. For example, the transit project, I know we moved that from inside the outside the project to inside the project. But now we have tra half a transit traffic, half a transit center, because we don't have anything on the west side of the street. So we need to fix that project. So that's an example of what's changed. But I also appreciate that the, that the, the Ramos team is really committed to trees, and they even have a member of their team on the Tree Davis board, and I think that shows a commitment to trees. Um, uh, but, but, but enforcement is the key thing, and this is my real critique here is not about the project, but about how we're going to make sure the project is actually delivers what it, it promises. Because we've seen landlords, the developer will do something and make promises, but the landlords found the road and people deliver it. And how are we gonna make sure this is really happening? So the next slide is, next slide please. We see with Steve Bannon, it's nice to have laws, but unless they're enforced, they are just pen the paper. And we need to, we have, we have, we've not been enforcing our tree laws in the city of Davis. We have an in fact deregulation. They're nice on paper, but they're not enforced. Next slide please. If we give you some examples, Sutter parking lot. I went through the EAR in 1993. They asked native, native trees for habitats, 50% shade in 15 years, parking lots, which are drained to the planters, hedgerows for plant trees, glare in the parlance, all mentioned in there, not enforced, not enforced. And, and when, they, when they basically reviewed this thing and they asked for a waiver, the, the staff did not even look at it. The plant that we have lost, they lost 25% of the tree species over the 30 years. They weren't, they weren't maintained. 
And because they lost those trees, the Sutter paid a lower mitigation fee. There's no enforcement of the law, even when it's written. And they don't care. Next slide, please. Target parking lot. There's, this is a case. It, it, we have our 15th anniversary since it was approved, 2006. Look at the trees. Do we have 50% shade there? It was promised. But any consequences? We don't, I can't even get a copy of the tree plan because the city will not release a copy to me. Yes, I can go in and look on the screen, but I can't even take a picture of the screen. There's no transparency, there's no accountability. And I'm told by Rob, oh, we can't stop this. This is a major tax, it's a major tax producer. We can't do anything to enforce this law. There's no teeth in this thing. And the trees are not pruned high. We, we, aren't, we don't have an enforcement here. And this is a project where they required to hire an arborist every year to look at it. And for, set, for the first seven years, it wasn't done. Nobody enforced that. And there's no accountability what's happening. We have no visibility what's going on there at all. There's no, there's no transparency, no accountability. Next slide, please. Gas station of Second and Mace. They had a promise 50% shade. They redid the parking lot. Staff did not go back, look at the old, old tree requirement. I called and said, why aren't they looking at it? So what they did to bring it up to code, they used public money to plant trees in that parking lot. They'll bring it up to code. Money that should have been for trees that were in low income neighborhoods. This is, the, this is the lack of follow through and accountability we have in enforcement of our promises that are in the law. Next slide, please. Um, baseline, we need to have the final tree plan plan to the tree commission, not just, and second, it should be released to the public. You can get around the copyright, that should be part of the plan. The plan should be releasable to the public so I can take a copy or anyone can take a copy of the thing and look at it and see what's actually been promised and what's results. Next thing, there needs to be a guarantee to give the, Previous slide, thank you very much. Guarantee, there needs to be either a, a high bond placed with real consequences or some best efforts enforcement. Well, there's a third party arborist hired by the city, not by the developer. You don't, the, the, a developer doesn't get a chance to produce, negotiate with the city who the building. Thank you, Alan. Sorry. Yeah, I hope that. Sorry. Yeah, thank you, Alan. Get a warning of the cutoff. Do you have a lot more that you you have prepared, Alan? Would another? Can you wrap up in another thirty seconds? Yes, I will. Thank you. Next slide, please. Transparency an enforcement method with reimbursement by the developer. The city should have an independent enforcement and that, and the real consequences defined up front. This should not cost the developer almost any money, only if there's follow through. The city has no method. We haven't done written the ordinance that there's no method of enforcement. It has to be put in the development agreement and the baseline conditions. We've been, two years, we've been starting the ordinance. We still aren't there yet. It has to be in the development agreement. Otherwise this project, all the, all the promises about trees are just words on paper. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate the time. Did we lose Colin? Um, we did. He's coming right back. Just one moment. OK. I uh, Colin everything went dark and then I didn't know where I was and then at the end of the tunnel there was a bright light Sorry. Uh, I apologize um, we do have one more commenter would you like to go to that now? That would, that would be great. Thank you so much. Hang on one second. Uh, we have Eileen. And I don't want to double click her because I might add too many people in, but there she goes. Okay, Eileen, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and share your comment. Okay. 
Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, yes, uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight, uh, Commission. Uh, I, you know, I, I appreciate uh, a lot of the comments that were made pr just prior to mine uh, and agree with a lot of them. Um, the only thing is, uh, for, for one thing, uh, development agreements are not more often than not uh, not worth the uh, paper they're written on because uh, uh, what's much more important, uh, well, what's important, equally important, is to have the language of having um, uh, sufficient a, a a number of trees. Number one, the the, the concept of of naming a uh, a number of trees versus this nebulous. Uh, you know, desired shade convert, uh, uh, coverage is, is you know, it, the the uh, there needs to be a number of trees defined, and it needs to be in the um, uh, baseline project features. Um, the whole purpose of why Measure J, which then became Measure R, Measure D now, uh, was was written was uh, for the public to have the opportunity to to uh, have input to get better projects. And so, um, but the only way you're going to get that to happen is through baseline project features of uh, Measure J. So uh, I can't emphasize enough that this concept that uh, uh, all of the things that have been spoken about that are desirable uh, in this DISC project, including um, a named number of trees, uh, you know, needs to be in the baseline project features. Uh, otherwise, it's just not going to happen. Uh, and, and the importance of trees um, have so many reasons, uh, you know, uh, habitat, you know, nesting sites, food sources for wildlife, uh, their cooling effect um, by transpiring water, um, lowering the, our, our, uh, our heat uh, island effect, uh, capturing fine particle matter, um, mitigating uh, gaseous pollutants, uh, cooling the air with a uh, vapor of heal, uh, cooling, um, and just the uh, aesthetics. So um, I, I disagree with the uh, the proponents, uh, you know, suggestion that you know we just go for <laughs> adequate uh, shade. That it, it needs to be nailed down to a number of trees. I can't emphasize that enough. And it must must be in the baseline project features or and any of these other desirable uh, um, uh, components need to be in the uh, baseline project features, not just development agreements. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. I see no additional raised hands at this time for public comment. Thank you. Uh, so at this point, I want to check in with the commission on how we proceed. Uh, it's almost 10 o'clock. Um, and uh, we haven't started actually going through the recommendations yet. Um, so I, I guess we have, I can think of several options in front of us and others may be able to think of other options as well. You know, we could break here and come back in, in uh, within the two week window prescribed by the council and finish our recommendations then. Uh, one advantage to that would be the subcommittee could fine tune things. Um, we could have some discussion now and do the, and break after that and come back. Uh, or we could try to power through and get everything done tonight still. Um, or we could do some intermix. We could see how far we get and decide later that we wanna take a break. But I kinda wanna check in and see how people are doing. Uh, 10 o'clock is a late meeting. So if folks wanna, wanna say something, please uh, raise your hand. John? Yeah, I would like to do this. I'd like to propose this. <clears throat> um, that we, um, we go over the committee's recommendations uh, we don't uh, necessarily try to wordsmith them or get them down and end this tonight because I don't think that's a very reasonable approach. Uh, we could be here for the next five, 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 five hours uh, wordsmithing and discussing. Um, I think we should just go through, hopefully all the commissioners have had a chance to read uh, our re re recommendations and we just go through it and, you know, you 
do they agree uh, in principle uh, to them? Are there, is there anything that, that they like to see added? And this goes back to the, uh, the committee. Uh, we do this ASAP and then have this special meeting. Thanks, John. Jim? I'm not 100% I'm not sure I understood what, uh, what John said. Um, I'm, I'm, I think it's too late for us to go through line by line through the whole you know, subcommittee report and so on, but I certainly think that we need to have some feedback and give the subcommittee some direction in terms of fine tuning and so on. Uh, so maybe uh, if we each make a few comments or something like that, and then try and meet again in a week or 10 days. Yeah, Jim, that, 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 thank you for saying that because that, that, that's exactly what, what I was saying. So thanks. Great, yeah, thank you both. Uh, Larry? Just to say that it's you know pretty incumbent on the commissioners to be efficient about speaking, saying what we wanna say and then ending, thanks. As demonstrated in a nice efficient comment. Uh, Matt, I see that you'd like to, to express an opinion too. Please. Oh, I, I, have no, I have no opinion. I appreciate all the time you've already given us. Um, what I was going to say is that if there is a copy, though, of the subcommittee's recommendations, we as the applicant didn't receive that. Um, if there's a way we could get a copy of that, that'd be useful for us to be able to take a look at too. Thanks. Oh, my sincere apologies. Uh, it, uh, it was, I know it's posted on the city website with the agenda. Uh, so I, I think it's, I think it's a purely an oversight that it hasn't gone out to you. Um, I think it went, it went to staff, uh, last Friday. So, but that I would, we would really like you to have it. Well, I think that's a really good reason to, um, continue things too, so that the applicant has a good opportunity to consider those recommendations. And actually I would throw out too, that, um, uh, in addition to, uh, what Jim concisely put is another possibility too, is that the subcommittee could potentially meet with the applicant in the interim as well to discuss and, and try to iron some things out too. Um, and Chair, I will say we would be happy to meet. We actually sent an email back on the 7th and, and did make an offer that if the subcommittee wanted to, to meet with us and learn more about the project, we'd be happy to talk. And that offer remains, we're happy to help. I mean, I think we want you to have all the information you need to make a, a good set of recommendations. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, I guess what I'm hearing uh, is I've, I've heard a couple people who sort of, who have the opinion that we should get into the subcommittee recommendations a bit now, and then uh, we, and then uh, schedule a special meeting uh, to, to finalize line by line with uh, Larry's point well taken as well. Does anyone else, does anyone have a counterpoint to that? Or is that uh, not seeing a counterpoint? That's what we're gonna do. Uh, John? Alan, the only thing I would ask, and I'm, I'm going along with Larry, um, if we could keep our discussion of it to a minimum, and if folks could just, uh, commissioners could tell us what, you know, no, we need to add this, or this is a bad recommendation, um, then the committee can then take take all that. We we do what we can with it, and then it all it, it all goes back back out. So 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 any debate I think wouldn't really serve a, a good purpose given the timeline we have. Right. Okay. So I guess what I would like to do then is uh, I'd like to have uh, oh Larry. How about this? Every commissioner gets one minute to make comments timed with our timer and then we retire, we can all email any other recommendation because I have, you know, item by item issues. We can email those to Rob, he can give them to the subcommittee, we can have a special meeting. Okay, is, uh, I, I, guess, I guess I would suggest maybe two minutes, but I, I do like the idea of timing it and keeping it concise. You know, the only thing I would add to that, Larry, I agree, is that uh, given the time, again, the subcommittee would really appreciate appreciate these things 
ASAP. Yeah. Cool. Rob, I see your. That's going to be another two hours. Two. Just to let you know, to go through line by line and have everybody have a minute or two. There's 20 line items. If you get one minute each, that's oh, six minutes I, per recommendation. I, I took him to mean total. Two minute, one minute or two minutes total. Yeah, I'm not going through line by line now, Rob. Sorry. Just right yeah, now, okay. if we have big ticket items that we want to communicate, and that's why I mean like one minute. I don't, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. And I, I would I would actually like to just say one other thing with that too is that if folks who haven't spoken up as much tonight to have a, a lot, you know, have more. I, I would want to be flexible that you get you get a chance because some people have spoken quite a bit more than others tonight. So, um, so uh, with if, if I guess let's proceed with the two minute clock and go go through. Unless if anyone would let, has a counterpoint, please raise your hand and we can do that. Um, you know, I do want to make sure to hear counterpoint. Uh, not seeing any hands. Um, so the I, I plan on going through the list uh, of the tree commissioners as I have tonight, but I don't want to put Jim, I don't necessarily want to put you on the spot. You've been on the spot all night. Larry, are you comfortable starting? It sounds like you might have your a good sense. Okay. So let's start with Larry. Okay, so um, enforcement, as people have been saying, is the key, and we don't have a tree ordinance that enforces, so I don't know, if, well, we can, we can recommend anything. The other thing is we're not writing laws, we're writing recommendations. So I would recommend language in here that the uh, development has to comply with the current uh, tree ordinance. So as that changes, it's still applicable. Not not the tree ordinance that's written right now when the pro if and when the project is approved. Um, the baseline features, things need, it, if it's not in the baseline features, we've seen it doesn't happen. Um, that I would remove the language mutually agreed upon inspectors. Um, yeah, the city should choose the inspector. Um, and, Oh, well, that's a specific, never mind. I do like the idea of the shade coverage. The problem we've had with developments in the past is if we don't have a number, but I don't want 1500 crepe myrtles. So if we don't have a number, we can't really nail it down. And so, I'm not totally comfortable going with um, with canopy coverage yet. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Um, so following Larry, um, I'm going to start back at the top of the list uh, with Jim and follow the same order as earlier. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I generally uh, was favorably impressed with the recommendations of the subcommittee. Um, I think that we need to, um, in terms of, of tree coverage, I mean, there's, there's just so much talking about how many trees and so on. We need to be a little bit flexible on that in that, you know, we have to recognize that we're going from four trees to 600 or 800 or 1200. I mean, that, that we're already talking about a huge improvement. So I would propose that we keep in the, uh, the, 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 50%, 80%, you know, shade coverage type of thing, but put in a, a mandatory minimum number of trees, uh, I would suggest something like 800. But then I would say that if we can't fit 800 in this project uh, in the manner that, that Matt has been talking about, that the excess trees be planted somewhere else, but that somewhere they have to plant 800 trees at a minimum, uh, something like that. And then I would uh, just reinforce what people have said that enforcement is key here. We have to have some sort of language in there uh, about the enforcement. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Tracy? 
Hi, thank you. Um, so I guess the main parts that I would like to see in here are in the baseline features, a specific number of trees. And I say that because it's just, I don't know any other way around it. Um, because there's really no other metric than the individual tree itself. Um, so I would also like to have um, some really um, strong enforcement in there. Um, I don't, I mean, and throughout the whole, throughout the whole project um, where it gives the idea that it's trees or solar, they're, they're going to go with solar. So I'd really like to just um, remove this contradiction or this um, really opposition between the two, because I really do think that solar and trees can coexist. And I think that the priority should be put on the trees, placement of the trees. And um, the solar can exist in so many different arrays. It, it only requires, from what I understand, that solar cell only requires 20% of the sun to be the most efficient. Any other solar cell go, that goes beyond that, I don't believe is going to be um, more efficient. So really trees and solar can, can coexist, I think very, very well. And I think the priority should be put on trees. And, um, and then I think I would really just like to see um, the, the baseline feature, the number of trees. And then, yep, that's it, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. And juggling my windows here, sorry. I gotta look at my list to make sure I have the order. It's John. Uh, so John, John's next. So really fast. Um, uh, I agree with everything that, uh, Everything has been said. Uh, being on the subcommittee, I, I'm, I'm involved and, and I know it, so I don't need to, to necessarily comment uh, uh, on what should be in there. Uh, you guys have largely seen it. Um, the one thing I am concerned with, and I don't know how we're going to get around it or how we're going to deal with it, is what Alan and, uh, and Eileen have brought up. And, and we all know that, um, that if we don't, you know, how do we get from you know, what's in the development agreement to what's going to be done and how do we make sure it's, it's done? And uh, I guess that's what has motivated a lot of my questions to Matt um, is how do we, how does the tree commission get to have input in a, a, a meaningful way? We all know that the best way to have input is, is to go early. And the more our input, are, you know, regarding specifics is pushed out because of, um, because of landscaping plans and the timing and all of that, I think our ability to have any impact on, 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 the, on the final project goes down. So that, that's it for, for me, thanks. Thank you, John. David? Well, the, the best thing about going last is there's nothing else to say. Um, <laughs> I, I, I agree with per, particularly what was just said about the, making our getting getting our ore in the water um, so that so that whatever the metrics are going to be whether they are going to be uh, uh, shade coverage or tree count that they are they are um, pretty much cast in stone I think I think that is going to be vital Thank you, David. Uh, so I get I have I get to go last, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna take the moment to mention a couple things that are some there's some positives. Uh, so the bioswales in the new project, I'm thrilled to see that. Uh, you know, we haven't talked about that at all tonight, probably because we're all thrilled to to we're probably happy to see that. Uh, structural soil uh, and other improved uh, plantings, you know, fantastic. There's some really good things that this developer that that you're that um, Ramco is bringing to the table, and I, I I really do value that and appreciate that. Um, I think you know everybody's said other things that I want to uh, would want to say. 
um, that coming to, coming up with the metric for that will be in the baseline features for what for trees is important. Um, the uh, and and parking lots how how to shade parking lots has been an ongoing question. Um, Matt, you are an excellent spokesperson. You probably you deserve every penny you you get. I'm sure you have done phenomenal tonight, and I really appreciate your candor and uh, you know willingness to answer questions and really give it you know give us so much attention. And I just I want to take a minute at the end in my time here to to thank you. Um, uh, and Sherry, thank you for all of your help as well tonight. Um, you know the you didn't speak up as much, but the things you did add were very valuable. So thank you for that. And I, I, I guess the last thing, uh, there was some talk earlier about the assessment. Um, it would be great if we could see the assessment and then um, let's be in touch so that we can meet, uh, you can meet with the subcommittee and we can try to iron stuff out and be on the same page. And that's all of my comment. Thank you so much. You, Matt, you. you look like you might wanna say something. Yeah. I, I just want to thank you all for your time tonight, too. You've given a lot of attention to this issue, and we appreciate it. Um, and that offer to meet with the subcommittee, absolutely. Let's follow up and get a time that we could walk through these, because I'm actually just seeing this now and be happy to talk through those and maybe maybe help um, add information. I see there are a few questions. So looking forward to it, and thanks again. I appreciate it. Yeah, so in terms of timing, I uh, we're going to want to do that like as soon as possible, right? Because if if our uh, maybe Rob can speak to when the next meeting would be I guess I'm sort of assuming it's two weeks from today uh, but maybe Rob wants to speak up if it's different or 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 if we're able to do anything different I know scheduling special meetings is tough um, but that timing wise assuming it's two weeks from today that means the agenda has to go out a week from tomorrow so Ideally, any new materials are prepared and ready and to Rob on Thursday so that it's easy for Rob to get them put to put them out. Um, I see your hand, Larry. Do you want to say anything to that first, Rob? Um, not sure. One, two. Yeah, that'd be the fourth. So yeah, stuff has to get me to a week from today. And there's yeah. just there's no other room there's because I've got other meetings that there's just no possible way to staff to get things posted and stuff back. It's just yeah, this is going to be a stretch as it is. Yeah, and we really appreciate your your efforts, Larry. I was just going to say the commissioners. The two things we need are the date, the last, the drop dead, the deadline. Sorry for our comments to get to the subcommittee and then the date of the next of the special meeting before we leave tonight. Yeah. So it sounds like the date for the special meeting is going to be uh, the fourth. Do you want to confirm that, Rob? We need to make sure we'll have a quorum. Yeah. That's two, weeks. two weeks from today and you have to finish. There's no other, there's no other meeting. So um, I'll take a straw poll about a quorum in a sec, but I see Jim's hand. I want to make sure that Jim has a talk, chance to talk. Uh, what's the deadline for us getting comments to city council or whatever? I thought it was two weeks from today. Yeah, my understanding is we can meet two weeks from today, but we absolutely have to be done at the end of that meeting. There's no beyond. Is that accurate, Sherry and, and Rob? Yeah, yeah you, you need to get your comments done by November 4th. By November 4th, period. But like it could be the evening of November 4th at the meeting, right? Yeah, that would be fine, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, John? So um, so, uh, so for the, the committee then and how the committee interacts, um, on that meeting, um, it sounds like the committee should get the language is clean, uh, and the report as as, as as clean as possible, so that only a, a few edits or a few additions, or subtractions are made. Yeah, and 
and I would add with the opportunity to meet with uh, with Mr. Kiesling, you know, as much agreement as possible would be fantastic too. Great. And so does that, so that means then uh, listening to Rob, that the committee has to get that thing pretty, I'll say pretty much uh, finalized by, by, by Thursday. This Thursday. Yeah, we have, yep. We have one week. Okay. Okay. So working back from that, um, when would the subcommittee like to have uh, comments to them uh, in writing from the larger uh, commission? How about mm -hmm. by 11 o'clock this uh, evening would be good. Uh, <laughs> uh, I see you, Matt. Um, the, I'm, I'm thinking like if, if it was on Sunday, maybe, that's the, a day I would throw out, Matt. Colin, I'm, I'm, I don't work for the city, so I'm going to advise that you maybe seek counsel from your counsel. But I don't, I be, the subcommittee can meet and the subcommittee can come up with recommendations that are then provided to Rob and then provided to the commission at large. But it might be a Brown Act violation to have all committee or commission members providing comments to the subcommittee that's then sharing those. I think that might be a Brown Act violation. You might just want to take that into consideration before you throw that out as an official way. Um, uh, probably it's cleaner just to have the subcommittee meet. And if you all want to meet with us, we're happy to do that. And then you put your recommendations to staff and then that's simultaneously distributed to the entire commission as well as the public. You could probably avoid that, that potential conflict. Great. I, Sherry and, and uh, Rob, if you want to speak to the Brown Act question, I think what Larry had proposed was uh, one way communication from committee members uh, to the subcommittee um, uh, and you, you, you know, you're the more the experts on if that's a Brown Act violation than I, um, I guess I've had some similar concerns, but, uh, have been told that this is okay. So I, I'd like to have your okay before we proceed with it. Well, to, to, to be brutally honest, my, most of my familiarity lies with the planning commission and we don't do subcommittees. <laughs> so um, it does sound kind of in the realm of, of a problem. So maybe the best thing to do would be to um, have us talk to the city attorney in, tomorrow morning and then get give you further direction after that as to how you might get the commit how you might get comments from others it may turn out however though that you cannot get those comments and you may have to just work as your subcommittee with based on what you know okay uh so i know uh, unless, I, I Rob, to... unless you know something different no i think email and comments to commissioners and subcommittees that we've already got in trouble and have Brown Act reply alls and things already. So I think it would be cleaner if, you know, um, I'm not sure what more recommendations could have been made after tonight. It was a pretty robust discussion. So I think, you know, there should be very limited. I could get them sent to me and then I can include them into the document for posting for the fourth. But there are other ways. I, would, I, would, I wouldn't be able to send them to the subcommittee. Well, I was just going to say one way might be able to happen would be they instead of the individual members sending things to directly to the subcommittee, mm -hmm. you may be able to send them to Rob. And then that was Rob, my suggestion. That was a suggestion. Yeah. But that's, that, we'll, yeah. we'll have to ask. Yeah. I'm, so I'm that's sure. well, that's the suggestion, and I know it's been done previously. Um, yeah. here's the, here's the conundrum, right? Is that, uh, if there is no certainty that that can happen, then I want to make sure that commissioners have an opportunity to give robust, uh, direction to the subcommittee, which there's definitely some at this point, but I think that if we're not sure and that, and, and there's some question of whether or not the one way messaging through staff. Uh, this staff could even strip out any sort of uh, um, name attached to it so that there's no, um, there's no sense of count of how many people are saying certain things. The staff could collate 
Um, I, I don't know if that helps, but if we can't that's, do that, that's, then it's then gotta be as clean as possible. There's minimal staff time to do this stuff right now. So, totally. yeah. you know, it, I, can't, I can't collate everyone's comments and things and, and get another subcommittee and collate and all those comments and do the other regular posting and things. So totally. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there are only, there are seven of us now, actually, no, there's still only six, three on the committee. That's three people sending one email to Rob. He forwards it to one of the subcommittee members so that they have it. That's pretty straightforward. It is, but it's a question of whether or not it's a, a what I think they call a serial meeting. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing you have to remember is if you are unable to communicate as a total group for the subcommittee, we still have the ability at your next meeting to go through these things yep. one by one by one. So yep. it, isn't the, it isn't the job of the subcommittee to come up with the answer for the commission as a whole. Originally, the idea for the subcommittee was just to develop background information that you were gonna use when the whole committee decides what it is that they wanna recommend. Mm -hmm. So I think you still have the ability, even if you are not able to communicate to the subcommittee to go through and hash through each one. It might take longer, but um, you still have that ability. I'm trying to save staff time at the next meeting. I know, but totally, it's, it's there. The Brown Act doesn't always save us time. It's not meant to save time. <laughs> right? No, it's meant to save democracy. That's right. <laughs> Uh, and I appreciate the Brown Act. I want to follow the Brown Act. That is always my intent. So what I suggest then is let's, if anyone uh, wants to make any um, specific comments and directions to the subcommittee of people who are not on the subcommittee, let's, uh, let's do that now. Um, if it were to be determined later that there could be one-way messaging, uh, if that could be determined tomorrow. Yeah, uh, you uh, can do then, it. You can try. We'll, we'll take those by Sunday and uh, then uh, subcommittee, uh, I'm hoping we can meet, um, you know, immediately after that on Monday uh, and maybe schedule uh, time for the committee and then time with Matt, if Matt's available. Uh, so subcommittee and Matt, think about that, look at your calendars while we're doing that. <coughs> If anyone has something they want to say uh, to, to give input to the subcommittee, um, now would be the time to do that too. I see subcommittee uh, members with your hands up. Um, John and Tracy? Yeah, I guess my only um, uh, message to the other co commissioners is that given that this is such a fast turnaround, I mean, we're talking a week. Okay, um, uh, it's not really two weeks because it has to get out to Rob, uh, so it could be on the agenda. Given that, uh, I would ask uh, I would ask your in, in, in indulgence in 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 what we come up with. Now, of course, I'm not asking you just to to, to 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 rubber stamp it, but I think we all have to realize that that we're not being given sufficient time. To really go through the the discussion process at, uh, as we'd like to do, so um, if I could just just put, just 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 point that out to people. Thanks, John. Tracy. Thank you. I just wanted to say that um, I wanted to ask Rob. Are, the, the subcommittee, we were, uh, there was some discussion of maybe not meeting on Wednesday, the 27th. Um, I just wanted to know if that meeting was still taking place because, um, and I'm, I'm curious to know um, if, if the subcommittee will be meeting um, with the developer um, over Zoom or in person. I was gonna suggest in person only because, the, I don't know, Zoom and then through the city, it would probably really limit us. So I wanted to ask about that. Uh, well, two things. Uh, I can provide a Zoom account to for us to have a meeting that's not through the city. Um, it's not an official city meeting. Uh, it's not. It's not a meeting that has to be noticed to the public. Uh, Matt probably has a Zoom link he could he could use too, alternatively. Um, but uh, 
I, if we do meet over, we could do that over Zoom. I'm a little worried about the logistics of getting together in person with the um, tight time frame, but I am open to it. Um, yeah, no, I think it's great if we can just get a Zoom going. That that's the best and the easiest. So, are we going to set up a time right now? The, um, you know, I have we have Matt's uh, phone number. Is it? Uh, let's. Let's coordinate right after the meeting so not everybody has to do this and we can we can end. But if everybody can look at their calendars and think about Monday for a time, if that's possible. And then we'll 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 coordinate over cell right after this, if that's good. You mean Monday a time to meet uh, with the, the subcommittee and the developer? Yes. Yeah, no, Monday is just not good at all for me. Okay. Uh, well, unless it was unless it was early early in the morning, but then I have to I have a doctor's appointment. I don't know. It's just a choppy day and lots going on. Yeah. Could 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 I ask? A, let's 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 uh, Colin. Let's follow Colin's suggestion. Yeah. Let's 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 do this when we're done or yeah, uh, whatever. Because I have to go go get my calendar. So totally and so let's do the calendar and and uh, i have everybody sell we'll we'll figure it out right after this yeah uh so with that if there's anyone not on the subcommittee who wants to give some feedback some input to the subcommittee um let's do that and then we'll call the and then we'll call that the end of this item for the night um so if you want to add anything and not on the subcommittee please raise your hand So, okay, I'm not seeing any hands. People may want to be done. <laughs> uh, so that brings that to a conclusion. So now the how we close that item is important as I understand it. Are we um, continuing it to a special meeting date certain? Is that the right language? And do we need a motion to continue it to a date certain? Yes. Okay. I move that we continue this item to a special meeting date of Thursday, November 4th, 2021. I second that. Great. Uh, you want to start at your regular time? Yes. That's good. Yeah. Try. yeah. Friendly amendment from staff member Metzger, 530, accepted by the mover. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, uh, so uh, Jim Kramer. Aye. Tracy DeWitt. Aye. Larry Gunther. Aye. John Rudder. Aye. Uh, David Robinson. Aye. And Colin Walsh. Aye. Great. Uh, and that ends the disc discussion for tonight. So commission and staff communications, this is the part uh, that we were talking about at the beginning of the meeting where liaisons and subcommittees can offer a report uh, and there can be some level of discussion about it. Um, it looks like Matt's gone. I was gonna say also thanks for, uh, thank you for sticking with us and the long discussion and same Sherry. I appreciate all the effort. Uh, but with that, uh, do we have any commission and staff communications? Well, I'll just mention really quick that um, at the last two by two for the uh, shade, the NRC t and shade and parking lots, um, we have decided on some um, guest speakers to come and teach us about and answer questions about solar. So um, it's very exciting getting down to the nitty gritty of all of this stuff. That's all. Thanks, Tracy. Yeah, is this when I give the cap uh, thing? Yeah, that okay. would be awesome. So I'll, I'll save my five minute uh, presentation for next month and try and uh, give the 30 second one now. Um, the, uh, without going into details, uh, the, the staff and, and consultants came up with a list of 100 possible actions for uh, climate mitigation and so on. 
They then, from that, came up with a priority list of 25 actions. And I will simply read the one that was pertinent to us, which was included as one of the 25 priority. And it says, expand urban forest with climate ready trees that provide shade and develop a tree replacement plan for street trees for all neighborhoods. So we got in with the uh, priority list of 25. Um, subsequent discussion, some of these 25 are gonna be combined, some are gonna be deleted, some are gonna be added to and so on. Um, I suggested adding the language that in addition to what that said, that it includes um, <clears throat> incentives for private landowners to uh, expand their, their tree coverage. Uh, there was strong support for the proposal and for my addition. And so that looks like that'll be included in the 25 high priority items. I can go into more detail next month. That's great, Jim. Well done, thank you so much. Hey, Jim. Uh, Jim, if I could just ask you, please, just to repeat, uh, was part of the proposal re re removing existing city trees and planting more appropriate uh, climate ready trees? The, the whole idea is expanding the urban forest. And I think as part of that expansion, it says climate ready trees. Uh, and then develop a tree replacement plan for street trees for all neighborhoods uh, that is climate ready and, and so on. So I, I don't, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that. That's, that's the extent that I know of what it, what it uh, was, was, what, what it was meant. Thanks, Jim. Are there any other commission and staff communications? Uh, I am seeing a public commenter with their hand raised. Do we take, uh, I was told at a different commission that we never, that they never take public comment during this section. Though I know historically we have taken public comment at this section. Do you want to speak to that, Rob? That's up to you guys. <laughs> okay, well, I would say that any public commenter, I can tell that the temperature of the commission is ready to go. So any public commenter who wants to, uh, to speak at this time must really have something they want to say, uh, but I would warn them that people want to want to be done for the night. So, um, John? Yeah, Colin, can I just say, if there's any soul that has stuck with us all this time, God bless them, yep. thank them, and ye let them speak. Okay, sounds good. So with that, uh, can we take the public comment? We have one public commenter, Alan Hirsch. You can go ahead and unmute yourself to share your comment. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, Courtesy. On the agenda says this is when you were going to talk about the next. On the agenda said this is when we're going to talk about the next meeting's agenda. So I have two thoughts. You should talk about the charter of the Tree Commission, which was made, which had a lot of discussion at the last tree, at the last city council meeting. The second was which you should debrief what we learned with the Sutter Tree issue. We shouldn't, that was, we spent a lot of time in that. We should go through, what did we learn? What could we do better and smarter? We turned what should have been a celebration of a hospital into a major political fight, which was unnecessary. What can we do better next time? Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate how concise that was too. Uh, the uh, points well taken. Um, you know, that reminds me, we, the, the subcommittee on the charter hasn't met yet. Uh, but my hope is that we will uh, have the opportunity to um, bring something back at the next meeting. Um, but so that may be an agenda item at the next meeting. Um, and the uh, relating to Sutter, also relating to DISC, I did note that uh, the Cousteau project uh, is going bef uh, that we sent a letter to city council asking them not to cut down all the parking lot trees, which is also a Dan Ramos development. Uh, that project and that uh, removal of trees is going before the planning commission uh, in, in the near future. Uh, are there any other commission and staff communications? Yeah, Colin, I just like to uh, yeah. I, I just like to say that I, I 
I, I would like uh, maybe a recap of Sutter put on there. I think it's really going to help uh, Tracy and I uh, yeah. when, when, when we start to get into the, 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 the nitty gritty of the uh, parking lot issue. Sounds good. Great. Uh, not seeing any other. Um, Rob, do you have a 30 minute soliloquy? Not seeing any other. Uh, nope. <laughs> uh, not seeing any other uh, hands. I think we're done with this item. So uh, it's unusual for the chair to make the motion to adjourn, but. Uh, if I can ask uh, the uh, commission to, uh, to allow me, um, tonight I would like to adjourn in the memory of Dina Gardner. Uh, Dina Gardner is someone who I knew growing up and went to school with in Davis. Uh, she was a really amazing person. We worked in student government at Davis High together and she was a, a warm person who was uh, friends with everybody um, and uh, went on to be a minister and uh, died very young uh, from a very aggressive cancer. And the reason I'd like to uh, adjourn in her memory tonight is that the tree that we, the tree, uh, the trees on Acacia are in front of her childhood home and her mother was at our meeting tonight. So uh, if we can, uh, I would like to move to adjourn in Dina's memory tonight. I'll second that, emo uh, that motion, <laughs> Larry Gunther. Great, uh, going down the list. Uh, Jim Kramer. Aye. Tracy DeWitt. Aye. Larry Gunther. Aye. John Rutter. Aye. David Robinson. Aye. And Colin Walsh. Aye. Thank you Good all. So much. Yeah. Well, thank you all. See you in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs>